Shut up! Ooh! Got lots on the agenda today. Fun stuff. Really, Joshua, you did it. 13 pounds in 11 days. Excellent. I'd like to think that I had a small part to play in helping Christians lose weight. <laughs> you know, how I, this is the best diet plan for Christians. If you want to lose weight, just shed your love for Jesus because the love of Jesus is so weighty. Just shed your love of Jesus. That's 20 pounds right there. You'll lose. Um, speaking of which, here's, here's my uh, weight loss notes. Started April 16th after uh, competition arose between me and Digital Gnosis Nathan. 203.3 is what I weighed in. Buck naked. Buck. I was buck, naked, or so you say baked, naked. I was naked, naked. It's hard to say naked, na like baked. Anyhow, uh, and today, this morning, I uh, after I woke up, took a wee wee, uh, buck naked, one ninety two point five. And for all you flag waving phonies out there saying this is terrible the way I'm doing this, I feel great. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I'm eating like 90%. Uh, let's put it this way. I'm eating maybe only 10% of my diet is carbs. And I'm eating one meal a day, 1,000 calories max. Keep track of what you eat. And I don't feel sleepy. I don't feel as tired. I, uh, I actually, yeah, I have more energy. The hunger pains left after day three or four, I think. I still get like the urge to snack once in a while in the evenings but uh no it's been going great and they say that to form a habit you have to go what 30 60 days so if i do this for uh let's see why i'm on day 17 if i do this for another 20 days i think i'm in habit forming and for those of you who say this diet's not sustainable i'm planning to do this until i die so you're going to see me all shriveled up and no, no. Once I reach my weight limit goals, I'll just up my calories probably to 2,000 calories a day and maintain. But yeah, it's, the only downside is you have to work at uh, keeping track of your calories. Like That takes a little work. You just can't do stuff. I mean, just eat whatever you want. No, you can't. You got to be more careful. So that's a pain. But once you get in the habit of... Um, of knowing, oh, if I eat this, this, and this, this is this many calories. You don't have to calculate each time. Do I exercise? Not yet. Uh, besides, you know, doing the, the typical things a 51-year-old does, like walking the dog, fixing the toilet that broke yesterday. You know, a lot of people in my position, because I'm a white-collar professional, you know, a lot of people just pick up the, the phone and call a plumber. But no, 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 not Pine Creek. Pine Creek says... I can fix it. So then I spent an, an hour trying to, this and it didn't work. And then I spent an hour trying this and it didn't work. And then I tried a, another hour fixing that. And then it worked. I got it, the toilet working, basically rebuilt everything for like uh, 30 bucks. Now, if you don't count the time I wasted spending my own time, um, yeah, it was better off hiring a plumber. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. It's fun. Like my fingernails are still dirty. Um, so that's, I shouldn't have said that, right? My fingernails are still dirty after working on the toilet. Okay, remind me, don't let me chew my fingernails during this live stream. 
because that would be bad. Although, do I have to add that to my protein calorie count? <laughs> uh, okay, so let's get to it. Um, this first clip I want to play, and I am open to taking your calls later. Remind me if someone wants to call in and chastise me for something. I love to be chastised. I like uh, to be bent over and someone just, just give me a good spanking. <laughs> Why am I in this mood today? This is crazy. Uh, the, just a little intro. This guy's name is Alex Plato. He's a philosopher, apparently. But don't hold, don't hold that against him. Like, hear him out. But basically, he's going to talk about how there's so many issues about Christianity that he was agnostic about, and, and yet he just trusts, he has faith, he accepts them. So why not the extra stuff in Roman Catholicism, and therefore he went from Protestant to Catholic, and he's explaining this to Cameron Bertuzzi. And I, I'm just thinking, this is it's good in a way, but it's nuts in another way, because he's admitting here that I don't have really good reasons to believe A, so I might as well believe B. That's basically what he's going to say here. And this is the problem, and this is why I titled this, Don't Lower Your Standards for Jesus. This is the problem that Christians have, and Muslims have, and Jews have, and probably Hindus, that if you're believing something based on this type of evidence, then what else are you forced to believe? And I think the sky's the limit. Okay, let's take a listen. Welcome if you're new here, by the way. Oh, Pine Points. <laughs> Almost forgot. The Ginger Beard Man. Is that right, Myron? G was he here first? What do you mean he's your cousin? No, I'm still going to give him Pine Points, even if he's your first cousin. Have you kissed him? No. Okay, then for sure I can give him Pine Points. 10,000 Pine Points to the Ginger Beard Man. 5,000 to Cali, the Poker Pro. And HK Fooey. Yeah, you can't be first, but you can be third. 1,000 pine points to you. And Conrad Rigier. Rigier? It depends if you're Quebecois or not. I'm the biggest loser. I will cower in shame. Yes, you will cower in shame. How dare you? But you look new here, so maybe I should give you a pass. You look Christian, too, in your, in your picture. You know, Christians have this certain look, like... <laughs> <laughs> this dazed eye look. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. Okay. I took this old Roman profession of faith, like the Tridentine profession of faith. You can look it up if you want on, online and find it. And there's all these things that are in contradistinction to the Protestant, um, the, the Protestant Reformation at that time. And it says, you know, I believe in the salutary um, um, use of relics. Oh, uh, Peter W., we're going to watch that too. Uh, Cameron getting interviewed by Braxton Hunter about Roman Catholicism. I'll play that probably last. I believe in prayers to the saints, and I, I, I affirm the Immaculate Conception, and I accept right the, the authority of the Church, and all these verbs. I affirm, I accept, I believe. Um, and I, every single one of them, I had these little notes I made underneath each, each item. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't affirm the opposite. Uh, you know, I, I don't affirm it, but I don't affirm the opposite. I, I don't accept this, and I don't accept the opposite. And so that, again, agnostic on every issue. And I took that profession of faith to a, 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 a friend and a priest, uh, and also a PhD candidate at St. Louis University. So I, another part of my story is I went to St. Louis University to do my PhD after Talbot. Richard, in the live stream chat, welcome, welcome, Richard. Uh, atheism is a blind faith based on worldview. Yes, Richard, that is correct. And if uh, you had just a little more faith, you could be an atheist like me. Have more faith, Richard. And I met this priest named Father Andrew Pinsett. And I remember I took him that profession of faith. And I sat down with him. I'm like, this is where I'm at. I really want to be Catholic, but I just can't do it. I can't be authentic. I, I would be lying to myself if I said I affirm these things. I accept these things. And he looked, he read the whole thing. He says, you're ready to go. And I was like, what? And he said, you, are you willing to believe? And that was his exact wording. I remember that specific. Yeah, part. isn't this amazing? He's expressed, Dr. Alex Plato's expressing his doubts. I, I, I can't affirm this. Uh, I mean, I'm agnostic. Well, you're ready to go. Just choose to believe it. Like, if you had that ad attitude, you know what? how many things in life you'd be forced to believe? Are you willing to believe? And that struck me because that was, for one, you know, has 
ambiguous, has two meanings at least. And so one meaning was, are you ready to believe? And of course, I had been ready for years, right? And then are you endeavoring to believe? And that's what I was doing. That's why I was meeting with him. And so I said, yes, I'm ready and I'm endeavoring. And he said, well, you just need to go make an act of faith now, a profession of faith in public. And I said, no, I can't. I can't do that because, again, I'm not. Yeah, authentic. I can't. And so, I wouldn't be able yeah. to do that either. Exactly. And so and so then he he said, well, go read Aquinas on faith. And I got the, I What's forget. the Catholics obsession with Aquinas. Like, do they have pictures of Aquinas on their wall that they kind of get excited about? What, which, it's almost like Catholics love Aquinas more, almost as much as Jesus. Which articles or which questions it is. Um, but he basically, in, in that section, Aquinas says what reason it does for you, right, is reason removes obstacles and shows you that none of these um, mysteries of the faith are impossible. So that's like such a minimum bar. Yes. Right. That, you know, the yeah. is not impossible. The incarnation is not impossible. Right. Transubstantiation, not impossible. Right. Uh, the, the papacy, the authoritative claims and the infallibility of the church in general, not impossible. I was like, OK. Um, and that's all there was. So I kind of realized I was I had been a rationalist in a certain way. <laughs> all these big claims like Jesus taking a piece of uh, cracker and transforming it into himself. It's not impossible. I realized I was just being a rationalist. I had thought that I had to have all these reasons worked out that would then give me evidence for these mysteries. And so I, I realized I kind of had a double standard in a certain yes. way. Yes. Like I already accepted the Trinity and I already accepted the incarnation. And, and so then I'm- Because having, the Trinity is not impossible, right? All these other doctrines, I'm, I'm like, why am I having a different standard of belief, so to speak, for these rather than these? And I, I couldn't, I couldn't resolve that other than, well, I already have trust in the church in a certain way. Trust is code for uh, faith, pistos. Because they're the ones who develop this in actual history, right? The Trinity, incarnation, these sort of things. And I said, well, a certain way I do trust them. Now, I don't know if it's infallible, right? I don't know if it's, if the papal infallibility claims on top of general church infallibility is also the case. But I did see, I kind of already believed those and I already trusted that. And so then in order to, to, to be consistent, right? Um, that was a motivation for me, but it wasn't a, yeah. I, you got to appreciate his honesty here. He's saying, I, I, I had this standard of, uh, being a Protestant. I had trust, i.e. faith that these things were true and I got to keep my standards low. And if I do, uh, then I'm being consistent, and if I'm consistent, then I might as well just adopt the Catholic uh, uh, propositions. It wasn't an evidential bump that I was getting. So again, yeah. on the, the, I, like I told you when we were in person in my backyard, it wasn't like some extra bit of evidence on top for me. I already saw the claims that you've explained on your show before, and I've talked about there's evidence for it. And yeah, there's some evidence against it. And I said, if I had to choose between, you know, the, the biblical evidence for it is claims in a 2000 year old text case for Sola Scriptura and the biblical case for the papacy, even though I was disappointed with both of them, right? From a philosopher's point of view, I was like, well, I'd bet on this papacy case if I had to bet. Um, if you had to bet. And so then it, to me, it was a matter of ultimately a matter of trust, a matter of my circle of trust sort of changing. And that was really hard because a lot of my most beloved mentors and friends who are Protestant. I, I kind of had to figure out, well, why don't they believe? Like, what's the difference, you know? And I had to work. I'd be very that. curious to know if uh, Dr. Alex Plato, if his wife, if he's married and if his wife has any Catholic background in her. That. And so then I had to see. Can I? Yeah, jump in. Can, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to pause a moment. So you, you were working through, like, you were trying to be consistent with your epistemology i suppose because you're what you're saying is that like you still had some beliefs that like were not based on this like rational process of like going through and looking for the evidence for and against but you nevertheless like had those beliefs like about the trinity and whatnot and is, is that what you're saying like when it comes to these other catholic doctrines like you just realized that you had a double standard there like you you didn't have this really high bar of evidence that was required in order to hold these beliefs with respect to like the trinity or or these other things but then when it came to certain Catholic doctrines, like you had that higher standard, that higher bar that needed to be met in order to 
to hold that. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Like, that's what you realize? I think something like that. But when I was an Anglican, I, I tried to, I tried to invent, right, a, a way of imagining Christianity where we didn't have, where I didn't have to choose between Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, but I was already kind of convinced of what I call history's Christianity. The way that we worship through time, the way that we thought through time, this has an importance, right? And though I didn't hold that the church was an infallible teacher, I thought, well, these people do, right? The Orthodox and the Catholics. Um, and so then I, I developed this model that I called reason in community that allows us to, in, in my mind anyway, it allowed us to disagree, right? But if we were all moral, right? And we were all, I mean, if we were all good and we were all patient and we were all loving, we would allow lots of toleration of disagreement and it wouldn't break apart the Christian church because I really cared about that, you know, Jesus prayer in John 17 about that we would all be one. I really cared about that. And that made sense. That's a good point. That's, um, it's obvious that Christians are not all one, even within uh, being a Protestant or a Catholic. And so I thought, how do I do this if I can't go all the way to this Orthodox or Catholic thing and say, well, no, I did not put a Twinkie in my mouth when I left. I had to let the dog out. Have the fullness of truth. So they're wrong about that claim, but they have part of it. And so then what I had to do to, to withhold to do that is basically treat every doctrine like the Trinity as technically speaking provisional. So I thought maybe, you know, Christianity is going to go on on for another hundred thousand years. Yeah. And I don't know if I like Alex Plato or if I don't like him. I kind of I kind of love his brutal honesty here. That he's kind of admitting he just likes things, trusts things, and has this low standard, and therefore he has to accept other things based on that standard to remain consistent. So I like that. But the bottom line is, why do you believe any of this is true? Okay, I want to uh, move on to um, Dr. What's his name? Doug Gruthius. Too bad it's not V instead of TH. Gruvius. Now that would be a name. But um, I caught him in a contradiction here, I thought. And it's on the topic of uh, the most important topic in Christianity that you can have, and that's the one on salvation. All right, here's a really uh, good question. Uh, debates about uh, going to hell. Is God present in hell delivering the wrath, or is it a separation from God? Uh, he made a spot where he does not go or cannot hear your anger or cries for help hmm well i think it's both a separation from the goodness of god so to speak uh and it's also a place of punishment so uh, the reason i really oh, this guy's a very slow talker which kind of bothers me and he kind of does this with his lips and i don't like that either but he says some interesting things here. <clears throat> Notice the plot hole. A lot of, most Christians believe that um, God is omnipresent. So if you say hell is a separation from God, plot hole doesn't make sense. And he's addressing this here now. Hell, more than anything, is that, I, that Jesus taught it. And he was warning us about it. And when you look at Matthew 25, 46, it talks about uh, the faithful who go into eternal life and those who have not served Christ going into eternal punishment. So if the life is eternal, then the punishment is eternal because the construction of the text is the same on both sides. These go into eternal life. These go into eternal punishment. That's a good point. So as far as I can tell, uh, this is a conscious eternal torment for those who finally turn their back Listen. on God. Hell is for those people who finally turn their back on God. This is important because he's a Calvinist, right? You, you all know where I'm going with this. And what exactly is the state of people there? I think I, I follow C.S. Lewis on this, that if anyone ends up in hell, um, in a sense, they have sent themselves there. In a sense. In what sense have they sent themselves there? because they've refused all the invitations, all the promptings that God has given in their life. And so By they're... refusing an action, they've sent themselves to hell because they've refused all the invitations. 
are confirmed in their damnation, so to speak. So uh, would they even, I don't know, would they even call out, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry now. I'm terribly sorry. Would you please help me now? Uh, it's, I'm not sure that would happen, although we do have the parable of Lazarus, um, you know, and, and he's an, uh, or the, the rich man in Lazarus and the rich man. You know, <laughs> this guy was a teacher from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's a little tough for me to put all of this together perfectly, but I can certainly say uh, that God remains on my present. Uh, forever. That's one of his attributes. So is he present in hell? Yes, because he is present everywhere. Do okay. We have so if God's present everywhere, then that means hell's not a separation from God. God is right there with you as you're being punished, right? Have the benefit of access to his goodness, not we, but you know, whoever ends up in hell, I'd say no. But it's hard for me to think of people in hell, uh, repenting because so i think they're beyond that i think they're beyond mm -hmm. repenting at that point so, so if they're then, beyond repenting does that mean they have no free will they can only do what they do can they theoretically repent not going to say uh you know lord you didn't give me enough chances in my life so uh, will you now get me out of this terrible place yeah, and that kind of goes against, I think, the way many of us were taught about hell growing up. And uh, I, in my book, I mention a traveling church play that depicted hell as this place that, you know, basically Satan was in charge and people would go there and they would be like so shocked. Oh, no, you know, I never got to hear the gospel, but I but I want to receive Jesus and they would be dragged off to hell. And that's just not that's not the way it is. I actually think Lord yeah. of the Rings with Gollum kind of gets this a little more accurately, where I think when people are given to sin, as we've all experienced certain levels of this, you know, we that sin is my precious. It's that's the thing. Yeah. Now, what is Alyssa Childers precious? It's Jesus, right? What if worshiping Jesus is your precious and that is a sin? Oh my goodness, Alyssa, can you imagine what trouble you're in? If Jesus isn't God? That we in our fallen nature are wanting to cling to, and that's what's even transforming us into this hideous monster like Gollum. Yeah, and, yeah. And I can't, you know, there's no sense in which Gollum wants to, you know, release the ring. And so, of course, there's work, mm -hmm. work of the Holy Spirit and and this time here, but it's, I see hell being like that, you know, like Gollum in the cave, just my precious and, but he's tormented. He's completely yeah. uh, tortured at the same time, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so remember what he said here. He said that hell is for, reserved for people who have refused all the invitations, uh, refuse to repent, turn their backs on God. And. Um, you have to have but he's that. a Calvinist working together, you want to defend the best take you have on what scripture teaches. So yeah. I guess if, you know, if I have to go down and say, I believe in the five points of Calvinism, I do. He does. And I think that Calvinism can give a strong response to the problem of evil. Yeah. And that, that is something that faithful Christians divide on, you know, how does free will work? How yeah. What's the Calvinist response to the problem of evil? Shut up and take it. God's the author of everything. Deal with it. That's the answer to the problem of evil for Calvinists. And non-Calvinists just stick an extra step in there and say, oh, it's human free will to blame. That all worked together with the problem of suffering and even who would be the creator of evil and suffering. Um, and so this, we'll, we'll just add this as a follow-up question because this is a good one. Uh, maybe this is the same mark, maybe it's a different mark, but it says, why do you think Bible-loving evangelical Christians differ on tenets of Calvinism and Arminianism? Great question. Well, I believe in uh, this doctrine called the perspicacity of Scripture. I think Scripture clear. is clear enough to teach us the most important things about God. You and know, it, how one is saved is pretty important. And Calvinism and non-Calvinism differ on how people are saved. Humanity and how to live in this world to the glory of God and the good of other people. But uh, it's a big book, 66 books. It's an ancient book. and People of good faith and goodwill and high intelligence have disagreed on these issues. And you just have to give it your best shot. Yeah, too bad God wasn't down here 
in the flesh today who could, you know, Q&A session with, with Jesus. Uh, you come to the podium, uh, Jesus, is Calvinism true or non-Calvinism? What say you? And then Jesus could just clear all this up. Uh, and that's not a very satisfying answer. But I'm not going to say that uh, my friends who are Arminians are somehow bad people uh, because their view is different than mine. Although I do really want to emphasize how sinful we are. And Listen. I think sometimes Arminians lighten up a little bit on that because they talk about, well, I chose the Lord and God gives us a choice. And I say, well, yes, but yes, we're but... dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2. So uh, dead people need a complete resurrection. Dead people need a complete resurrection. We are sinners. We are dead in our sins, as it says in Ephesians. Yet hell is for the people who refuse the invitation, who refuse to repent. How does this compute? Dr. Douglas Gruthius, if you ever hear this, you got a problem on your hands. The reason why, according to your beliefs, the reason why every single person is in hell or will be in hell is because of what God, your God, did not do. And that is resurrect them spiritually, regenerate them spiritually, quicken them from their death and their sins. Your God is blameworthy for every person who's in hell. And for all you non-Calvinists who are saying, yeah, preach it, Doug, preach it, you have the same problem, except you just put one, you just have to go back one more step. Your God's responsible for every person in hell, if there is a hell, by creating in the first place, knowing with 100% certainty that some people will end up there. All you had to do is not create anything. Oh, but I want to go to heaven, Doug, because I want to see Grandma. No, well, Grandma wouldn't exist if God didn't create anything. Deal with it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. He talked about, there was a question on Old Testament atrocities, and that never gets old. That's always fun. Uh, oh, we passed it already. 104. By the way, this is from Alyssa Childers channel. Alyssa Childers. I think that's how you pronounce it. Where God instructs Saul to destroy the Amalekites, including all the children and infants. Can you please Alyssa leans non-Calvinist lines. Around it. We have seen God bring non-Israelites into the fold. Example, Rahab, some Egyptians who fled, fled with the Israelites, etc. Why couldn't they adopt the children? I understand we are born sinners, but these children didn't have a chance to accept or reject God. Were they not also knit together and fearfully and wonderfully made in his image? There's lots of tough stuff in the Old Testament, but this one I'm struggling with. And Oh my goodness, Rebecca Overstreet, learn how to a ask a question. Just all you have to say, what about the babies in 1 Samuel 15? Question mark? That's all you have to ask. And, the, and I tr trust me, Doug Gruthius is smart enough to know exactly where, where you're going with that question. But let me answer Rebecca's question. Um, those babies were not killed. They were just transitioned from earth to heaven. God was doing them a favor. And their parents are really rotten people, and they deserve to die. Done. Let's see how Doug, uh, the other Doug answers it. Before uh, Dr. Grotice answers this, Rebecca, I do want to let you know that I have a pretty extended podcast episode with Clay Jones on this topic, and we do address mm. this question very specifically and in-depth, because this is something it's tough to answer this in just like a couple minutes. It is. Um, so oh, proud I'll... Pharisee! Uh, you're, I know I got your emails. You're welcome to come on after this. I'm probably be doing this for a little bit longer, and then I'll open up the room. You give a few thoughts there, um, okay. Doctor Grotice, but but just want to refer you all to that podcast where we spend a good hour, oh. and mm. and you know we go into depth about the children and and all of that. But uh, I just wondered if you had some thoughts on that. See, God knew that every single baby, every single baby would, if they were to grow up, would be evil. And would never choose him. So he figured, I just smite them now. But why isn't God doing that today? I mean, we could save a lot of problems in this world if God just killed every baby that he knew would be heinously evil. 
Well, I'm going to defer a little bit myself because my book, Christian Apologetics, has a chapter by Dr. Richard Hess, who's an Old Testament scholar. And he does a lot of work on the wars in the Old Testament. And he, I don't know what Clay Jones said, but Rick Hess believes that some of that language is hyperbolic. That it, did Clay Jones say that also? Uh, yeah. Hyperbolic is another way of saying not true or lying. <laughs> because either 1 Samuel 15 says, kill all everyone, including the infants, or it doesn't. But it does. Now, did God really say that to Moses or not? He, uh, I'm trying to remember his exact view. He has a few quibbles with people like Paul Copan and others in, in how far that hy hyperbole like, might Where's go. the hyperbole in here? Let me uh, bring it up. Because I'm, unlike a lot of atheists, I'm not scared to dive into the Word of God. <laughs> uh, 1 Samuel 15. Oh, the New International Version. Uh, Samuel said to, to Saul, I am the one I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the people. So now listen to the message from the Lord. You can replace the Lord with Jesus. I know the Jews don't like this, but this is true. This, now, this is the message from Jesus. Jesus said, this is what Jesus says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel because, you know, Yahweh is in the real estate business. And whenever you start uh, getting involved with Yahweh's real estate, he gets mad. He's, he's worse than Trump. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Is that the hyperbole? Totally destroy? Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. Man, the poor animals. What did they do? I mean, if these camels grew up I mean, they'd be evil camels. Who knows? They might grow a third hump. So what Douglas Gruthius is, I think, uh, embracing here is, well, yeah, God, Jesus said to totally destroy them all, but he really didn't mean it. Like, just kill maybe half the babies? Is that where the hyperbole lies? Kill maybe 80% of the babies? Maybe let 20% live? Like the really good-looking babies? Oh, uh, but, but he does acknowledge, I believe, that, there's, that there is at least some. Yeah, Dr. Hess thinks that language such as was just referred to is very likely uh, common hyperbolic language used for warfare. And there's even some evidence that supports that in terms of the results of the war. And I'm really not going to pretend to be a, a great Old Testament scholar here, but there's a general principle uh, that some groups of people uh, reach a point, kind of like a point of no return, and they become thoroughly... All corrupt. things are... See, the, here's another plot hole. Aren't all things possible with God? If some... And as a Calvinist, isn't it God who regenerates the people who are dead in their sins? How can there be a point of no return for people if everything's possible with God and God is the author of, the, of how people come to know him? Can these people not see these plot holes? Like if you're a Christian listening here, you, you hear what I'm saying, right? This Dr. Gruthius has to be incorrect here. But it, if you say he's incorrect here, that some people, I mean, everybody's redeemable, then there's no need to kill everybody. You just sit them down, like uh, do First Kings 18 for them over and over again until they become convinced. Oh, you are the one true God. ...in every way, and so the judgment of God comes against them. And we don't, uh, in terms of children... Uh, it is hard to think of God commanding his own people to kill children. Why is that hard for you? <laughs> I know it seems like a rhetorical question, but if he's God and he can kill babies, why is that hard for you? 
It's because your moral intuitions scream to you that this is wrong. Listen to your moral intuitions, because we have evolved this way through the process of <laughs> revolution, revolution, um, evolution. This is why. It has nothing to do with your deity. Uh, that's certainly not anything that would happen today in the New Testament period. But Oh, you sure about that? He's saying that Jesus would never kill babies today? Dr. Gruthius, read the, the book of Revelation again, will you? And then see if you're going to say that. And again, we have to say God is the Lord of life and death, and he uniquely is in the position to render judgment, but then we've got to look at the text carefully and try to determine uh, what in fact occurred, whether the language could have been hyperbolic language and so on. Yeah, if that's hyperbolic, and when Jesus says, go kill everyone, and if he really doesn't mean it, what else did Jesus say in the New Testament that he really didn't mean? Like, is Jesus appearing at 500 hyperbolic? Was it maybe 50? Jesus had 12 disciples. Is that hyperbolic? Maybe he only had four? Jesus walked on water. Is that hyperbolic? Maybe it was, he was just wading in shallow waters? Where, where does this end? I mean, I want a firm foundation here. I don't want to stand on sand. If, if you're throwing out hyperbole, I mean, I'm just like rocking back and forth. I want something concrete. But Dr. Hess has a very good appendix in my book called Apologetic Issues in the Old Testament. So this is a big book, uh, but I had my New Testament colleague, Craig Blomberg, write on the reliability oh, of the New I Testament know him. and Dr. Hess write on some of the issues like this, like war yeah. in the Old Testament. Okay, the next one is on uh, multiple wives. I've been thinking of getting another wife, so... Uh, God accommodated the culture and the laws related to polygamy in the Old Testament actually are more humane, made for a more humane... Okay, situation. this is really good. Think about um, slavery in the Old Testament and the, the common answers you get for defending... Christians defending slavery, and even Jews defending slavery in the Old Testament. And listen to how he defends polygamy. Actually are more humane, made for a more humane situation than the nations around Israel. So you won't find anything in Scripture that commands polygamy or really says that it is a good and healthy way Unlike to Unlike slavery, this is interesting. There's no command to have multiple wives, but there is command... Well, it's uh, what, maybe not commands too strong of a word, but uh, there is a verse that says, you may buy slaves from the nations around you. It's more like an accommodation. So when you look at the Old Testament law, it talks about uh, dealing with several wives. And uh, women did not have the kind of... You know, and even that is a bit of a plot hole. When God talks about the Word of God... In the Old Testament, when it talks about Solomon having, what did he have, 300 wives? It doesn't say one wife and 299 concubines. It says 300 wives. It's God, in his sovereignty, has saw fit to use the term wife for all 300. I mean, Yahweh is succumbing to the moral cultural curve of the day, it seems. Got to be stronger, Yahweh. The opportunities and status at that time as well. But it's pretty easy to see what the biblical norm is. It's right in Genesis. Uh, God made male and female. That's not quite true. See, even that alone, I think should... If, if you are a, a bi biblical literist, you think everything is literally true, there are some... It's a very, very small fraction, but there are some people born both male and female. Like, you're done at this point. You know, oh, the Bible's wrong. Let's move on. For marriage, for procreation, for love. And anything outside of that really comes from the fall. So God didn't start out and say, well, you could have monogamy, you could have polygamy, just, you know, be nice. Uh, <laughs> he's got it laid out right at the beginning. 
and polygamy. Yeah, and here. it was also laid out right in the beginning that you should only eat vegetables. Now, later on, God said it's okay to eat meat. But still, the original design was for all humans to be vegan, or at least vegetarian. There's later in the Bible, but it's never given that divine blessing, you know, that the male and female in marriage is given in Scripture. Um, now, if you want to make it even more complicated, uh, there are some cultures today that have polygamy, and then, let's say, People convert. Let's say a man's married to five women, and they all okay. Come to so this is for the Muslims listening who have many wives. Listen up. If you become a Christian, this is what you do. Christ. Uh, what happens then? I've even had students uh, from Africa that have raised that question with me, and uh, the best answer I've come up with is, uh, given the situation, and given you did make a commitment to these women, uh, you just can't divorce four of them and just leave them out in the cold. Uh, so yeah, because who's going to keep you warm? <laughs> that could be accommodated. It would almost be like accommodating mm. what was going on in the Old Testament. But of course, you would yeah, never want God that. is a God of accommodation. Yeah, I know slavery's wrong. Yeah, I get slavery's wrong, but, <clears throat> you know, we don't have a, a welfare system yet. And I mean, this is actually good for the slave. I Yeah, I know uh, having many wives is not beneficial but you know women can't do much so we gotta you know marry as many of, of them as we can to f feed them and clothe them and have babies with them god's very accommodating that to happen again you would teach people in the church just ask joseph smith you don't pursue polygamy but if it's already occurred and there's that dependency relationship then uh that could be tolerated uh, yeah. for a time the easy ones today. okay yeah. so this next question and this is the last one then we'll move on to uh cameron bertuzzi's um flirtations with, with catholicism um there's many christians who will say things like i'll ask a question who's sa how what do you need to do to be saved who's saved who gets to go to heaven and they'll often will say uh, all those who confess with their mouth that jesus christ is lord take up their cross uh, repent the variation of all those answers but here, Dr. Guthius admits, you don't even need to know Jesus to go to heaven. Right. Well, I spend quite a bit of time on that in my book, Christian Apologetics, and it's an issue that Christians from the beginning have considered. The straight ahead answer is no, not everyone who has not heard of Christ would go to hell because you have the faithful Jews in the Old Testament. Oh, uh, a Pharisee guy. We got a Pharisee in our... And then uh, people think I'm joking, but we got a real Pharisee in the live stream chat right now. There's still hope for you, my Pharisee friend. Just because you are a Jew and a Pharisee who rejects Jesus... Well, no, it, sorry. No, no, Jesus already came, and you already know. You've heard the gospel message. No, sorry, you're going to hell. I take it back. Who trusted God but they had not heard specifically of Jesus. They may have had a faith in a coming Messiah and so on. But the best way to approach it is to say that God reveals enough of himself to everyone to hold them accountable for their response to what they know or what they could have known. Yeah, this is really interesting. So God holds responsible those what they know. Remember, he's a Calvinist who believes that you're dead in your sins so even what you know is God's responsibility, not yours, because it's the Holy Spirit that guides to all truth. Another major plot hole. Oh, it gives me a headache. And Romans 1 and 2 lays that Pharisees out. are not bad, Jerome Robinson. Hey, they're not bad. The Pharisees were right when it came to Jesus in the New Testament. So Christian thinkers have considered... Uh, various possibilities. For example, today we have a lot of credible reports of Muslims around the world hearing uh, the gospel in dreams and visions, or maybe angelic visitations. So that certainly can happen. And uh, there's some indication, I think, in Romans 2 that if people respond rightly to the light... I wonder if they... Dr. Douglas Gruthius thinks that that is a reliable way to coming to Christ through dreams and visions. And if he would say the same thing for Mormons. 
or does dream dreams and visions of Jesus only work in Christianity? I mean, no, that doesn't make sense because the it's the Muslims are having the dreams and visions. I mean, this couldn't I have a dream and vision to? In fact, I did. I, I mean, I just remembered this. I had a dream last night. I had a vision. It was clear as day last night that Jesus Christ is not God in flesh. Did not die for your sins and did not rise from the dead. I, uh, God came to me in a dream and told me this. Should I take this as truth now? If you say no, then I think to be consistent, you have to say, no, you shouldn't trust those Muslims who say they saw Jesus in a dream and then become Christians. That, that God had anything to do with that. Have from creation and conscience that they might be able to uh, cast themselves on God's mercy. So what's non-negotiable is that Christ is the one who redeems us and saves us. There's no one else. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The next issue is how much do you need to know about God? Yeah, and this is a scary thing because uh, you evangelicals out there, if you go out evangelizing and you give a clear presentation of the gospel who, to a person who's never heard of it before, and if they reject it, from the non-Calvinist point of view, you've sent them to hell. You did. Because there was a chance that they might go to heaven because they would be judged on what they knew, which was nothing about Jesus. Then you give a clear presentation of the gospel, and all of a sudden now they could be judged according to what they know, which is the true gospel, which now they have now rejected. Now they're going to hell. I tell you, you evangelical missionaries, you got to be very careful. I wonder how many missionaries have sent people to hell just by giving them the knowledge of the true gospel. In fact, to play it safe, why are there any missionaries at all? You'd be better off doing no evangelism. Now, I know God commanded it, but you guys say, hey, God, I know you want me to go preach the gospel, but if I do and they reject it, I mean, I'm kind of responsible for imparting this knowledge of the truth, and then, then they reject it. Just say, forgive me, Lord, but I'm going to disobey you in this one area so this other person doesn't suffer an eternal torment. <laughs> you know, the thing is, Christians are listening to, right, to me right now, and they're like, they're disagreeing with me, but yet they see the logic involved, and they go, he's kind of right. And it makes me feel bad. In order to be saved. Now, we know it's certainly sufficient for one to confess Christ as Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. But is that necessary? And a variety of thinkers have said, and I say this in my book, that God may have other ways of getting through to people. I think he does. Yeah, actually. God has other ways to get through to people other than through confessing Jesus as Lord. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Um, oh, this is fun. Cameron Bertuzzi, flirting with Catholicism. This is always fun because it, it's similar to... Um, a deconversion and conversion to a new belief system. Catholics and Protestants are quite different in a lot of ways. They're also similar in some other ways. Uh, let's see, where do I have this? So as we've been talking on the phone and stuff, uh, and we've talked about this, and Cameron knows that I, I'm not seeing what he's seeing exactly, and I think that resonates with a lot of you out there who think, I don't get it. I'm, I'm, you're, I hear what is being said in terms of reasons to believe that it's true, and I immediately think of a number of things. Um, and then there are Catholics over there that are like, man, I maybe the only reason that um, that he's not already Catholic is because of what it would cost him. And so I've, I've thought about this and I brought up to Cameron. And I said, you know, I don't, and I'll say this publicly now. I said, I don't know if God laid this on my heart to tell you this or if it's Braxton. What? You don't know? But I'm going to tell or you. Maybe oh, a little bit. It could be. Quiet, but, quiet. But you, Braxton, you don't know if this is your thoughts or God's thoughts? Do you say that with just this one issue or all your issues? <laughs> How do you tell the difference? Well, if it's in the Bible, then it's God's thoughts. And if it's not in the Bible, then it could be just my thoughts. But the people who wrote the Bible, 
maybe that wasn't God's thoughts either. Maybe it was just theirs. No, 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 no. That's that couldn't be. Well, why not? Well, because I just I I trust that the Bible is authoritative and the Word of God. Well, why? Well, because of the prophecy of Tyre. Oh, yeah, that one. Gotcha. But but you decide, okay? Okay. I'm just not putting this on God's lips in case it's not, right? <laughs> but but I, f I felt led to tell you yeah, that. Yeah, Braxton um, is a lot better than the New Testament gospel authors because they put a lot of stuff on the mouth, on the lips of Jesus by reading the Old Testament. I believe that if you become Catholic, there are going to be a number of things that are going to happen. What? What's going to happen? I believe there's going to be a lot of fanfare. Uh, and, and, and understandably, people are excited, you know? And I Most think that you're going to talk about that experience. And, and I think that it's not inconceivable to think that the Cath that some Catholic organization may um, ask you to write a book oh, yeah. about your experience of assessing the evidence. Oh, oh I should have that uh, show me the money clip here. Have you on shows. It, it could be a big thing. And so in a certain yeah. respect, for people who are trying to develop an, a, a platform for the good of the kingdom, that could be a strong influence itself. And then, of course, on the other side, there are cons. And so I thought what we could do here is instead of talking about whether or not Catholicism is true, what I've run into with, with Cameron is when we've been talking and I'm, I'm talking to him about whether or not it's true, I'll ask him a question about the consequences. And often he'll say to his credit, I haven't even spent that much time thinking about the consequences of affirming this. That's not true. Because later on, he talks about his wife doesn't want him to be a Catholic. So he's thought about the consequences of becoming Catholic. Do I want money or do I want coitus? Money, coitus. If I had money, then I'd get all the coitus I want. No, no, no. Just kidding. I've only really been thinking about is it true or not? Because, of course, we want to affirm things that are true, right? But I thought here we could talk about the consequences of remaining Protestant or of becoming Catholic. Why did you agree to talk about this with me? I, like I mentioned briefly, I, this is not something that I've really like done a whole lot of thinking about. And you just mentioned that too. So it, it's something that I would like to explore. And you seem like the perfect person to actually explore some of these consequences with. So that's why I'm kind of willing to talk about why it is now. Braxton? Is that I just, I think you're the right person to do why it. Why is with. he well, the right person? <clears throat> you've come to the right place, Cameron. I agree. <laughs> um, uh, I got to mix in a little Pritchett when Jonathan Pritchett, my coast, isn't here. But uh, yeah. all right. So. Obviously, one of the most obvious implications is related to whether or not it's true. Yeah. But I think it's still worth talking about, which is the the salvific side of this. Mm -hmm. A lot of Protestant salvific uh, for the atheists in here who don't know Christ Christianese. It's like, well, one of the consequences of becoming Catholic is you're going to go to hell. Like that's just obvious, right? You're going to go to hell if you become a Catholic. Or from the Catholic perspective, you, you may go to hell if you're a Protestant, depending. And I think a benefit is, if it's true, forget which side you should, in a Pascalian sense, sort of come down on if it were just on this one thing. Um, uh, the, the, the fact about it is there are goods like coming into the right understanding of God's kingdom and all those kind of things, and we want that too as Protestants. But in terms of the salvific side of this, that seems like the stakes are really, really high. Um, are they that high? And what? so my understanding of the playing field is if you became Catholic, mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily be required to think. That <laughs> I'm suddenly There's missing. a good clip. If you become a Catholic, you wouldn't be necessarily required to think. Dun, 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 dun. Not a Christian anymore. Right. So do you want to, do you, do you have any thoughts about that? That I don't have a whole lot of mm -hmm. thoughts on. All I know is that from, from what I've heard, Vatican II has made it clear that Protestants can be saved. And oh, isn't that like nice? Brothers and sisters in the kingdom. Oof. So. Oof. Oh, that's so nice that the Vatican said that you can be a Protestant and still go to heaven. Oh, so that's the only, like the extent of my knowledge on mm. the salvific side of things. So yeah. it's. That that's really all that I know. Do you get a sense that's something that some Catholics would have their own like maybe? Can you have a difference of opinion about that to your understanding? No, no, no. Uh, Catholics don't have their own opinions. They when it comes to theology, you just listen to what the church says, 
and you're done. Am I right? Is Joshua still here? Can I get an amen? You're, when you become a, a Catholic, your last decision when it comes to theology is to say, I accept Catholicism and all the other list of things. That, and then your thinking's done, over. You don't have to think for yourself after that. You just say, yes, Pope. Okay, Pope. Whatever you say, Pope. There is the possibility. So, so there are some, I think they call them rad trad Catholics, where they deny, I think they deny Vatican I and Vatican II. <sighs> I could be wrong about that, but I know that for sure that they deny Vatican II. So there are some Catholics who deny that those... Yeah, are, isn't that interesting, David Friskin, that the whole concept of Pascal's wager comes up from going from Protestant to Catholic. Medical councils or, or the, uh, I forget what you actually refer to them as, but there are people who reject those documents mm. as like valid. Gotcha. So there are some. Okay. Uh, I'm going to fast forward in it here because I don't want to listen to this whole thing, but this is uh, about his wife. Okay, so there have been times in my life where I've moved on a doctrinal issue, mm -hmm. not something as grandiose in the way we described a moment ago as embracing Catholicism. And, and I think the fact that it is so grandiose is why some people speak of it as a conversion, even for a Christian. Yeah. Right. But um, when I've moved on doctrinal positions, you know, I've never had if I'm convinced something is true, I've never had any trouble saying I'm convinced. this is true because i can defend it but myron when i talk when you see my lips move you you unmute me no just get out i've had enough of you today go yeah i fixed the toilet yesterday go clean up around it that's what you yeah that's what you're good for you clean the toilets i was just telling that joshua is very close to becoming a non-Catholic because he on my own channel has admitted to when I ask him why do you believe X he says because the church says so his last decision was to say I'm a Catholic and then but people didn't hear me because you had me muted okay I accept your apology now go clean the toilets but where I've worried is in terms of how my family might react to that and I could see while Listen. we talked about some of the pros of becoming Catholic, and, and I do want to come back to that because I had asked you earlier today, and I'd like to ask you again why you would like to become Catholic. Um, but what about the pressure from those closest to you? Or not necessarily the pressure, but the worry about what would they would think. Yeah, Braxton, are you worried about what your wife would think if you left Christianity? Or your kids? Or Jonathan Pritchett? Your favorite friend. This is one thing I don't think uh, Christians appreciate. That when ex-Christians like myself leave Christianity, how much we were willing to sacrifice. We sacrificed way more than what Jesus did. Because with Jesus, it was three days. Well, six hours on a cross. But this is a lifetime of friendships family that you're giving up or potentially giving up i mean the real sacrificial lambs in the world today are those who have deconverted out of religion who were previously in it but uh, we're not asking for ad adulation or, or respect we're just stating the facts here yeah there that is a, something that is weighing heavily on me as of late is like what this would actually look like because as i've like done this study on the on the papacy and i'm like getting more confident about the numbers and everything that are in this document that i've created it's looking like it is a real possibility that i i should be catholic and and really everybody should be catholic if, if this is true but um that's it, not true Something can be true. That doesn't mean you have to follow it. it. Like, what does that actually mean for me personally and for my family? And it's been weighing heavily on me lately. Like, 
there are reasons why I want to be Catholic. And I've said that before. One of the biggest reasons is beauty. Like Catholic Catholicism, I, I, I find a lot of beauty in, in the liturgy and in just the churches. Yeah, this I, can... I don't get. Well, maybe I kind of get it. It's just not the type of beauty that I'm attracted to. Like, yes, you walk into a big Catholic church and you see the, the wood and the stained glass and the idols on those on the wall. I mean, the pictures on the wall. Yeah, it, it's nice. But the whole the whole thing about stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, blah, 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 say this in Latin, blah, 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 stand up, sit down. Uh, repeat after me. Like it, it, okay, I'll just be very honest. To me, it takes a certain personality type to be attracted to that type of stuff. Rituals, that's it. It takes a certain type of person to, to actually desire rituals. <clears throat> it's the type of person, in my opinion, who, who's not a creative thinker, who just wants to be told what to do, wants a rule book. It's the type of person who prefers a nine-to-five job rather than being their own boss, an entrepreneur, who has the freedom to do this or that. It's basically someone who's desiring to be a slave. Cameron, are you desiring to be a slave to this ritualistic thinking? General, and, and the way of beauty is like a way into Catholicism. Like that's a, a traditionally known way of, of becoming Catholic, actually, is through beauty. Yeah, and, uh, desiring structure is the, uh, I guess, the nice way to put it, Claude. I, I was a little more harsh. But I don't uh, see. Do I desire structure? Well, obviously not. According to how this live stream is going <laughs> and how I conduct my YouTube channel, but I do like patterns. I guess, um, like we all have routines. But even then, I'm the type of person. Like this is a true story. I'm the type of person who I'll wake up and I'll say to my wife. Let's go to Disneyland tomorrow. Now, there's going to be some women listening right now who are married with kids who are hearing this and saying, that's nuts. But when we were homeschooling both our kids and we had that type of freedom, there was many times that within 24 hours, we were in a different state, like 24-hour notice. We just up and went. I mean, that is so non-routine, non-structured, non-ritualistic. This is like spontaneous life. That's fun. I actually hate it the other way around where <clears throat> you look at your calendar and you got all these things on your calendar. Oh, next month I'm doing this and the month after that I'm doing this. this and... I mean, to me, that's the definition of jail where you know where you're going to be and like a month from now, and what you're doing. But maybe I'm weird. I probably, yeah, I probably am weird. Uh, Bishop Robert Barron is actually one of the big guys on that. Anyways, that, that those are some of the reasons why I've been drawn to it. But now I'm like, how is this actually going to look family-wise? And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. My wife is like not on board with me becoming Catholic. And so why not? Like I, we haven't really discussed it because I'm still working through this analysis. What? If she's not on board and you haven't discussed it, what? And my wife is like not on board with me becoming Catholic. And so like I, we haven't really discussed it because I'm still working through this analysis. And so I, I haven't really actually come down on either side. If Cameron's wife is listening, just get on your knees and start praying. All things work for good to those who love Christ. If you pray hard enough, Cameron will not become a Catholic. You don't have to worry. Or think of it this way. If Cameron does become a Catholic, uh, maybe he'll make more money. And then you can buy pretty things. So I'm kind of like just 
pushing it off to the side and just like, I don't know what I'm going to do if it actually gets to that point. But I've just kind of been like not thinking about it. I wonder what Catholics think. Like, so I wonder what Catholics would say. And I'm sure there's a variety of opinions, uh, but Catholic thinkers like we would talk to. Mm-hmm. I wonder what they would say about a person who be- who believes, comes to believe that Catholicism is true, but believes that people who are not Catholics are not necessarily unregenerate. And his wife or his or her husband, let's say, in any in either case, is like, no, I'm Protestant and that's just you're just gonna have to I mean that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Okay. Is that I wonder if Catholics, I wonder if there are any Catholics who would say, given that that's the case, it's more important that they be one flesh in worship um, than go to different churches and God would be fine with that. I'd like to know how Catholics would react. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good question, Braxton. Good for you. <laughs> Like the, <clears throat> for those of you who are atheists, this you know none of this makes sense. But this whole idea that your spouse, you and your spouse, are one flesh, and you have to be one flesh in worship, really? Can your spouse be a Catholic and you a Protestant? Can your spouse be a Mormon and you be a Protestant? Because Mormons view themselves as Christians, you know. Yes, I did leave Christianity at age 35, Lawrence. How many people leave after 35? Not too many. I purposely waited to 35 so I could be special. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know that too. I wonder if there are any Catholics who are like, no, stay Protestant. Or like, yeah, I want to know. I'm serious. Like, I want to know. Yeah. You know who you are. If you're out there and you're a Catholic and you are, I'm not going to Yeah, say my guess is, and this is just a guess, that most Catholics, Catholics would say, no, it's more important to be a Catholic than to remain a Protestant because your spouse is, because Catholicism is true. And Protestants got some things right, but they got a lot of things wrong. I bet that's uh, what they would say. But yeah, I do think that. Fess up. I want to hear it. I want Cameron to hear it. Write it in the comments right (laughs) now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I want to know that too. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good question. Okay, so we've talked about that. We've talked about the doctrinal stuff on either side. Um, uh, Where do you sit on Catholicism? Okay, so so for me, that's a really good question. So I'll tell you what. I have a story with this. Okay. A few years ago, um, I had a friend who, and I can tell okay, you. Okay, I don't want to hear Donald. the story. I got to do one little thing while I'm gone. You can watch this nice little clip. I got a lot of good comments on this one. It does not compute that. Why would you, if you're writing down your personal testimony of how you met Christ, which is what Matthew's doing here, yes, you would not copy someone else's work on how you met Christ. And that's what Matthew, if you really believe Matthew wrote Matthew, that's what you're saying. You know what? I like... He's, he is adding some additional details, but I mean, like, if anyone else thinks I'm just brushing this aside, like, I don't see a problem with this at all. So, like, if, I you, know, guys, I, if I, you guys all think that this is a problem, then say, yes, Rebecca, this is a problem. This is no, no, a this horrible, is, horrible problem. No, no Rebecca, it's I not just, a horrible I just problem. I don't it, see an issue with this. Right, I understand. There's... There's bigger fish to fry, I get that. But on this one little meaningless point, I think it's incredibly, what I just said is incredibly reasonable and expected. That if you met Christ, you would not copy your personal testimony from someone about your personal experience of meeting Christ for the first time. And that's what Matthew's doing. He's copying Mark and and using his himself in the third person. The two uh, that's checkmate, you're done. Yeah, checkmate, you're done. Because nobody, nobody would do that. <laughs> Skyve, can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Fantastic yourself. Good, you have a nice voice. Thank you very much. Where, where did you get it? Um, I got it from... Uh, my mother's womb. 
what do you want to talk about? Are you a Christian? I wasn't invited here by a friend. I, I thought we were maybe all going to gang up together and have a chat. Um, Which friend? Uh, his name is Ludwig Wittgenstein on Discord. I don't uh, that name sounds familiar. I used to be on Discord. Well, well, let me ask him. Hey, what's your username? Anyhow, what do you want to talk about? Um, usually he does the talking, and I just uh, add commentary. Oh, so you don't? You just want to sit here and make witty remarks? <laughs> but it's not. It's not like terrible. It doesn't like throw off the discussion. Are you a Christian? Yes. Okay. How long have you been a Christian? My whole life. Your whole life. Are you Catholic, Christian, Protestant, Orthodox, Mormon? I'm non-nominational, but I'm starting to uh, think that Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy um, is better than my version of Christianity because it's very, um, it's very New Age-ish. It's like speaking in tongues and uh, charismatic. You can't interpret the Bible correctly unless uh, you were born again and the Holy Spirit is in you. And you would know if it's in you based on feelings. So I don't What know church do you currently go to? What, oh, you don't want to give me the specific location or anything, but what? It's a Pentecostal church. Okay. I used to go to one of those. Um, it's yeah. fun though, right? Not really. It's like a really strict Pentecostal type of thing. It's not as charismatic as most of them. Oh, are. they're very controlling. Like, do they tell you who to marry and who not? No, um, but like they'll seat the men on the right side, the woman oh, on the really? left side. They'll separate everyone. Yeah, there's there's no crosses inside. There's just a cross on the outside. Um, but isn't that good? The woman, they cover their heads. There's no drums. The music is like. But isn't that good? Like, like to have the women separated from the men, so we don't like want to stare at their kneecaps. <laughs> or their shoulders. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's yeah. the focus should be on Jesus, not on women, right? Yeah, honestly, it, it does make a little bit of sense. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, my friend's saying uh, you won't let uh, him in. So I guess well, who's your friend? No Is it Darth? I know. Has Darth tried to get on? Oh, here? yeah. I've talked to Darth several times. Oh, wow. But um, that's fine. We can. I can talk to you. I'm gentle as a kitty cat. I think I'm really boring. Uh, but I did have like one question. Uh why are you not on TikTok? Um, because I don't have cleavage. You don't need cleavage. You don't? No. I thought you have to be young female, just, uh, dance, and have cleavage. Just get like a vape pen in your hand and just talk about God. And people are like, whoa, this, who's this guy with a vape pen talking about God? Do you Are you on TikTok? I used to be. I used to have a few uh, channels about Islam. And they all got taken down. Oh, really? All of them. Yeah. That's too bad. But do you like yeah. f find yourself tempted to look at scantily clad women on TikTok? Um, I guess I was, uh, but I got off TikTok completely because I got banned three times. You had banned so. from TikTok three times. Yeah, three different accounts destroyed. God. Well, maybe that's good because yeah. if you were tempted by scantily clad women and that's a sin, then maybe that's God's way of telling you, you know, stay off TikTok. It could be. The Lord know, works in mysterious ways. Yeah, see, that, that's one of the other annoying things these Christians say is they, they got all these like phrases like uh, money is evil, like they'll, they'll pervert it somehow. But but actually, it's money is the root of all evil. But they'll just say money is evil. And then they'll say the Lord works in mysterious ways whenever they can't answer something. And So yeah. why are you a Christian, you think? I, I believe uh, in the Gospels. They make sense. They seem to be reliable. Uh, they, dive, they diverge on small issues. They converge on big... I meant on topics and converge on big topics. Um, have you ever heard me do the flying man? Yeah. Um, with, uh, Trent Horn. Oh, you watched that debate. What'd you think of that debate? I watched that a few days ago. Um, I thought Trent won. Um, it's somewhere in the debate. You said like, this isn't even my argument. Something along those yeah. lines. What did you mean by that? Well, my opening statement, I quoted, I tried my best to quote 
just Christians. And I made the mistake of quoting right. Protestants instead of Catholics. Right. That was my bad. But um, so everything he responded to, he was actually responding against other Christians, which was kind of fun. And at the, at the beginning, yeah, I made yeah. it very clear that I was going to do the debate differently than this resurrection debate's ever been done because like, are, are we sick and tired of resurrection debates? I'm not. You're not? I, like I am. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, what is your argument and why are you an atheist? Okay. Uh, I'm an atheist because I don't believe the evidence is sufficient to believe any specific forms of theism. So for example, um, with Christianity, I don't think a man, the, the crux of it is, no pun intended, is the uh, resurrection of Jesus, that he was God in flesh and he died for your sins and rose his third day. Um, in order for me to believe that, uh, I would need uh, sufficient evidence. I do not believe the evidence is, is even close to being sufficient. And uh, so therefore, I can reject Christianity right there. Um, now, I could go into deeper things like the problem of evil or divine hiddenness, but I don't even need to go there. I can do similar things for Mormonism, similar things for Islam. Uh, even though I'm not well versed in Hinduism, I think I could do similar things for hin Hinduism, and therefore I've now chopped off the top four religions of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. What if, uh, like, there are some people I've, I've met um, that do have, like, experiences with Holy Spirit or uh, they have visions. Um, they have like prophecies about the future and they do happen to be true. Do you think that's a good enough evidence? No, for God? not even close. And here's why, because a good example is uh, take your version of Christianity versus Mormonism. They mm. both rely on the Holy spirit as a way of coming to truth. The Mormons call it the burning in the bosom. The evangelicals like yourself would call it the inner testimony of the Holy spirit, but they're both leading them to, what most would say contradictory views of God. So therefore you would have to say, okay, they're either one's right, one's wrong, or they're both wrong. They both can't be right. But regardless, mm -hmm. it's a horrible way of coming to knowledge because it just shows you that this idea of, of visions or the spirit uh, getting you closer to truth is not reliable because all religions actually have it. And they all can't be true, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so if we can't use visions and dreams and that sort of thing, what else do you think we could use? Um, well, one of the things about, like, the, I guess, the miracle about Jesus Christ's resurrection is that, um, I guess, one of the reasons we could believe that is true is because of the 12 disciples like giving up everything that kind of oh my gosh i actually have to go i'm getting a phone no, call. no 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 Sorry, no you I'm take that here. phone call you turn it off my goodness we were just getting somewhere i was about to pry him from the hands of jesus but god intervened god said nope not today not on my watch pine creek no, you don't touch my child. Thanks, Yahweh. He's talking back at me. <laughs> I think it, it probably was Canadian Catholic calling him. Like, abort! Abort! <laughs> <laughs> hey Pharisee, you want in? Oh, uh let something shine. Yeah, that's every teenage Christian. Yeah, that was Ganesh calling. What he was about to say is the disciples were willing to die for their beliefs. This is like a, 
old, tired, uh, apologetic. And to me, what I would say to that is, do we have anybody claiming they saw the resurrected Jesus? Number one, in order to be a martyr for the belief that Jesus rose from the dead, you've got to have someone who's actually an eyewitness. That's number one, which he would say disciples are, but they, none of them claim to be. Not even Peter. Read First Peter, assuming he, he wrote it. Uh, and number two, you've got to know that they had the chance to recant, that they would have lived if they would, would have recanted and that they died for their belief in the resurrection. And Christians, even educated apologists, will admit that, that that's an assumption, and that they'll admit that these are stories written decades, if not centuries later, saying that these Christians died. And by the way, back in those days, some Christians were willing to die for almost anything. Like, they just... It's like... Oh, this would be such a great thing for my kids if I became a martyr. I'm not interested in that mockocracy, but I did see that she was talking to a Satanist. Room's open. If, uh, what's, what was that guy's name? Start with an S. You're welcome to come back. Now that I just demolished the martyrdom apologetic. But that is basically the one, like even with Trent Horn, that's the last thing he said. Like, but, 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 we have these martyrs. What do you think about healing testimonies? I've never known anyone healed until recently. End stage and operable liver cancer completely gone. Final secret of chrono. How do you know God was involved in that? How do you know, how well did you know this person? Were they on chemo when it went away? Like, all these healing stories, like, stop it. Unless you can get things that are so difficult to explain, like the laws of physics being broken. Like, don't tell me, oh, someone could sort of see, and then they got prayed over, and then now they have 20-20 vision. Like, don't give me that garbage. Give me someone who's had an eyeball crushed, lost, gone, and then they get a brand new eyeball from God. Then you got something. Hey, Desi, did you change your name? Were you always Desi? Uh, no, one second. Uh, it's the same. Uh, I, uh, I turned off my camera. Is it okay? Yeah, I know who you are. Okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't change. It's Daisy Neo. Yeah, I remember I had to change my name because of situation on YouTube and stuff. But yeah. Okay. What? What? what do you want to divulge what happened? Uh, basically, I got uh, my my wife's uh, family background. They started giving her a hard time my, and her friends about like, look what your husband is saying online, oh. and you know because of the Islam and all that stuff. So. It created a big issue, and then she requested, "Okay, put turn uh, take off all your videos and all that." So, so we came to a compromise. Like, all right, let me do something else. I'll create a new channel. I won't use my face anymore. I'll just use a synonym or whatever. So she's like, "Okay." I mean, she's still not happy about it, but at least this way, I had to shut down my old channel, create a new channel with no face. What would have happened if you uh, were like me and just said? Um, no, stay unhappy. <laughs> yeah, no, the the only result would that be would be divorce basically really? straight away. Yes. She threatened you either do this or divorce? No, it's it's not a threat. It's basically by default because as a Muslim, you cannot be married to a non-Muslim. Like a, a your husband cannot be a non-Muslim. So if it is that, it is it's not up to her. It's like by well, Wait a minute, but you are a non-Muslim. Well, yeah, I don't believe, but I mean, 
uh, as long as you don't in all as long as it's a secret it's okay it's like no yeah as long as it's like voldemort that who cannot be spoken of so don't say it but oh, I mean, wait a know, minute so don't publicly admit so it. in the quran if it says that if your spouse becomes an apostate you have to divorce no it is already divorced like the minute the person converts the divorce is by default because according because uh, marriage is basically religious marriage we are not talking about social marriage or okay, okay. Like so does your marriage. wife in her brain view you as divorced like are you too divorced in yeah if i if i openly admit to her that i don't i have left islam then it's automatically a divorce wow so how yeah, how's it going between you and her it is uh, i mean it is more of like a compromise in the sense of like all right fine i'm not going to be openly in front of anybody saying that i don't believe this stuff so just keep it on the down low i keep it to myself and to my friends on youtube and stuff on a different synonym but i don't i cannot openly say it to anybody in my family anybody in my anybody who knows uh, me see but uh, in real life wouldn't you and i be horrible people if we said to our wives hey um no, don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Don't tell anybody you're a Muslim. Keep that private. Like, what would... Yeah, but, uh, yeah, Doug, you understand. When it comes to religion, there's no logic or sense <laughs> when it comes to that. It's pure emotion. It's pure faith. It's pure, like, this is what I have to do. I have no other, like, thing for it. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I can't talk... I cannot talk reason or logic or anything with her because she's, she's uh, super religious. She's not, like, just... Uh, flag waving mo phony Muslim. She's like <laughs> hardcore Muslim, you know. How many kids do you have? Three. What's what's the age range? Uh, Thirteen, twelve, and eight. Oh wow. Yeah. Yep. It's <laughs> a tough one. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, in my sense, I feel uh, the way I look at it is also. The reason I'm compromising a little bit on my side also is because the way I look at it, she didn't sign up for this. Right. Like she's when she married, she married a Muslim guy. She did it. She held her part of the deal. You know, I'm the one who reneged on my part of the deal. So I should bear some burden on of trying to compromise a little bit because she's like, hey, I married a Muslim. I want to be with a Muslim. Like you're the one who changed, not me. So I mean. That's the way I yeah, I, and so I've said like, the oh. exact same thing about my wife too. But my wife still like, um, she might not like the things I say, but uh, she understands that this is what I believe to be true. I mean, I believe Christianity is false, and so therefore, um, you know, for me to say any, to for her to ask me to stop, it'd be like for me to ask her to stop going to church. Like it, it's just right, obvious. But it. Yeah, but it doesn't work the same way on both sides because Islam is obviously the truth. So she's obviously on the right path. So whatever she's doing is the correct thing and whatever I'm doing is obviously by default the wrong thing anyway. So me not believing in Islam is is obviously wrong straight away. And it's, Do you want me to talk to her for you? That... <laughs> yeah, no, that's not going to work out very good. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, as you know, you've dealt with enough Muslims. Uh, it's not, I mean, when it comes to religious doctrine, it logic and reasoning has very little to do with it. It has to do with just faith and pure faith. And I believe this and there is nothing else that will convince me that this is not true. And all the people, the only people who actually do change their mind are the people who start thinking rationally and start questioning it. But that's the very bad thing to do in Islam. Don't question your religion because it even in the Quran it says if if somebody asks you they will ask you who created you and then they will ask you well God you will say God and then uh, then they will ask you who created God. If somebody says that know for sure that that is the devil speaking and just if somebody asks you that ask for forgiveness from Allah and ask for his protection and don't dwell into that question anymore like it literally says that in the book so it's not a lot of uh, questioning when it comes to religion of course they say you can question whatever you want i mean you talk to any apologist or anything the first thing they'll say we are the only religion that allows people to question us 
we will answer any question. We don't mind questioning, but that's only for outsiders. For a Muslim, you're not allowed to question because either you believe or you don't. What like. do you think is the biggest driver for your wife on why she believes it? Hellfire, obviously. I mean, it's a hell and heaven situation. So in, in Even for me, when I was, uh, you know, Muslim at that time, I, the fear of hell was the biggest factor that kept me in because I was like, what if it is true? What if there is a hell? I mean, so if your wife, I want to just if your wife started doubting hell, do you think she would start doubting Islam? Mm, I, I would think it's more of like more of the indoctrination from childhood, how they are raised. And then the, the more they get into this society, this culture where everybody around you is the same thinking is a group think. And like, I don't know how it is in Christian families who are very uh, religious, but in Muslim families, every other sentence is something to do with God. Like, God forgive you. God will do this. Oh, did you get that, uh, you know, coffee from there? Oh, thank God I got the coffee because because of God, I went to the car and God helped me go through the red lights. And, you know, the green light came because God, you know, everything is God, 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 everything. And, oh, in in Arabic, it's they usually say it in Arabic. The mashallah, inshallah, mashallah, everything is God, 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 God. God. Does your wife so, believe that you're going to go to hell when you die? Yes, if I am non-Muslim, then I will go to hell. And, that is by default. And how do, how yes. does your wife live knowing that? It's there's a thing called in Islam called Wallahu Lalam, which means. Only God knows. So whenever there's a tricky question like that, which they don't want to answer or which they don't have a clear answer for, they just like, well, only God knows. And then they just drop it over there. So that's a very easy answer to pretty much the majority of the tricky, sticky points. But she does whenever believe you that them, right? if you were to die today, she does believe you're going to hell, right? So she wouldn't say Not really because, God knows. Because in my sense, in front of her, I haven't publicly confessed or said anything that I'm so for for her she knows that I don't believe all that stuff but at least you haven't openly confessed it so it's the whole confession sort of thing so you don't openly say but you have done of you people. have openly confessed that before not to her in that sense I'm like well I'm still doubting I'm still questioning and I mean for I told her like I don't believe all of these stories the way it's written in the Quran so I'm in my own quest to figure out the right answer so i mean she i mean she's not stupid she understands that i don't you know but uh, to keep the whole thing going she's like all right fine well don't just don't say it out loud you're not a muslim because then it's over so do what you want to do but if she was listening uh, right now which she could be then it would be over no really then it would be over yeah so when you say over you mean she i mean she she would have to well, she would be separated from me. Oh my goodness! What, what? This is only for like people who take the religion very, very. I know, seriously. but you're taking uh, a huge on, risk on here because you don't you want to be with well, your mean, kids, the, right? I mean, the thing with her is, yeah, but the thing with her is, uh, she she never goes to any atheist channels or any atheist uh, or any anything that's outside the religion. She has no interest though. The only interest she has is with religion and that's it she would never even on my channel like she knew i had a youtube channel and all that she never watched a single video of mine or even anything uh, she's like i don't even want to hear it just keep it away from me i don't like i'm good with my religion i believe my religion I yeah but it's truth. still dangerous because like even me like i've been on hamza's den before let's mm -hmm. say your wife was to watch hamza's den and see me on there now my name is pine creek which is pretty neutral as far as religion goes and let's say she clicks on a pine creek recommended video and boom here she's listening to her own husband yeah then it would be a big problem i mean uh the only solace is that is that she is not that type she doesn't go looking for information like that anything that contradicts islam she'll just shut down right away if you say one thing against islam she'll shut down your channel right now she'll turn it off right away so at least, I mean, it's it's complicated, as you know. The Islam is a really complicated. I thing. do not understand they, that. Yeah, they are. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, the moderate Muslims, like you know, everyday Muslims. They are not, not talking about those. I'm talking about the people who take their religion super seriously, like 
like they put the religion above everything else. So if the religion says X, it's X. Doesn't matter what they think or doesn't matter what they feel. If a religion says X and it is X, you know. Like even uh, the guys on Hamza's Den, um, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't, they could listen to my channel and some of them have, have admitted to me they have. And they actually said that, that they like me and I'm, they find me funny. They love it when I pounce on Christianity. But um, well, they are the Hamza Den is a Dawa channel, as you know. Dawa is basically evangelical uh, Islam. Like they are basically inviting people to Islam. So they are out there confronting you, and basically their whole mission is: well, let's talk to Pine Creek, and then the Muslim will see us that we are not scared of these atheists. We'll challenge their views, and we'll show how Islam is better than. So the Dawa channels are more like: oh, oh we are the best. We. See, these people don't know anything. See, <laughs> we crush them. We crush their arguments. You know, the Dawah channel on those like people are mostly this way. The more humble type of uh, Muslim ap apologists or imams and stuff, you won't see them doing these type of Dawahs, you know, conversations online and challenging each other's views and all that. They are more like, you know, subdued and they just keep it to themselves. Only they'll talk to people who come to them. They won't go out looking for a challenge. If I were to ask your oldest child if they're a Muslim, what would your oldest child say? He'll say yes. Okay, so you haven't been the devil to your kids like I have to mine. Oh, no, no. That, I I thought about it and I said, you know what? Do I want to do the same thing that religious people do and indoctrinate my kids into my view? I said, no, no, no but I, I didn't do that, do that either. But what I did is I yeah. just, they came to me with questions and I just answered them. Yeah, no, I do that too. If they come to me with questions of uh, uh, like, like logical questions, like, does this make sense? I would tell them exactly like, oh, you know what? Think about this. Does this even make sense? But there's a line I don't want to cross with them because it's like, it, it, I have given my wife permission to teach them things about Islam and all that. So I'm okay with them learning about Islam. But my hope is that if I'm in their life, as they go forward and they listen to my things for how I talk about things, they'll it'll, it'll get give them a hope and uh, it'll give them a seed of uh, doubt, seed of uh, questioning. You Do know? your kids know and you have a see, oh, YouTube channel? Uh, not about these, the, the about the Islamic channel. They know other things on YouTube and stuff I do, but they don't know I have like more of like this type of channel. This I keep it separate from them. I don't uh, try to influence them with this sort of thing. But my hope is as they grow and they have access to internet, they have access to knowledge, they'll have a more, a little bit more skeptical mind and they'll question. I never had that. I never had access to internet or any of these information until I was like 35, 30 or whatever. But for the kids nowadays, they have access to all the information and they have both sides. So if they have a question, they can search it up. We didn't, we never had that chance that if we had a question in the religion, we could get an alternate view. We only could get the view from the Imam and that's it. You know, whatever his interpretation was, was the interpretation we had. But only now that we have access to internet and we can see other alternate views, we can make a decision. And now the kids nowadays go and that's a, one of the reasons why you, you notice a lot of people in the Muslim society, they're complaining that their kids are leaving the religion is because they have so much more access to knowledge. So yeah. it is a big problem in, in, in Christianity happened a while ago and now it's happening in Islam now. Yeah. Yeah. So was there? Uh... Yeah, just a question I had to ask. Um, uh, I mean, how would I was watching this debate between um, uh, Matt Dillahunty and Asadullah? Uh, he's like a Muslim uh, apologist, but very, very you know philosophical. He's got a PhD in philosophy or whatever. Uh, one second. Uh, just one second. Take your time, Matt Dillahunty. Yeah, no, what, what I mean, uh, I watched the debate with Asadullah and Matt Dillahunty and some of the points that Asadullah brought were very, very uh, interesting and convincing. He went with the uh, contingency argument, you know, everything that is there depends on something and all that. And he tried to use a different approach. He tried to use like, what is the answer that has the least amount of contradiction? And let's take that answer. And hey, everyone.
he it was pretty interesting he's like you know uh, something cannot uh, the infinite regress he tried to use that like okay something cannot have an infinite regress. is it this one so what are the uh yes this one okay yeah it was a very interesting debate and i heard his arguments and i thought how do you approach the contingency how, what are your counter to the contingency like everything that exists is depends on something so some I, it cannot keep going i think uh, graham oppie um had a great answer to this that the universe in its entirety the cosmos not just our reality not just our mm -hmm. universe with a small u but everything is necessary and not contingent and it, that it uh, has always existed um throughout time whatever that means and so basically whatever answer you give for the same questions to god to allah that Allah is not contingent. He's necessary, right? That's what the Muslim would say. Mm -hmm. You could say the same thing about yeah. the cosmos. It's not contingent. It's necessary. Mm -hmm. And you're done. Yeah, I mean, I think the Matt Dillahunty kind of used the same approach also. He was like, oh, we're not talking about the universe. We're talking about cosmos and all that. But yeah, I mean, some of his points, Asadullah's points were pretty interesting also. I haven't heard that approach also. Yeah, trying to use... Uh, least amount of contradiction well the, the, the key is answer. as graham oppy would say the key is not the least well you don't want contradictions but you have less fewer assumptions when you just posit the material realm has always is, is existed and is in its entirety as necessary now everything things within it can be contingent or are contingent but the whole um a, a, what's the word Accumul accumulation of everything is not contingent mm. so and and this yeah. is sounds very similar to what uh, a muslim or a christian would say well that's god well if you're going to define god that way then sure but at least oh, you're not you're not is, assuming this this other dimension of reality called the supernatural or the intangible or whatever right. his his counter to that one of the things that he said was interesting he's like let's assume cosmos always existed Things are changing in cosmos. Let's say, you know, planets are being formed, stars are being formed, whatever is being, even the Big Bang, let's say the initial Big Bang, if you go, things that changed from one position to another require some sort of decision. Like it wouldn't just happen by itself, right? Something changing from position A to position B has to have some sort of reason for it to change. Right. What would be that reason for the cosmos to have to do something? Like for something to happen in the cosmos, what would be the reason for it? Uh, well, it it happened because uh, once the Big Bang was started, then you have a chain reaction of cause and effects, right? Yeah, but what what start? Let's say assuming Big Bang is the beginning. Quantum fluctuation. To, for, I mean, quantum fluctuation. And it, it doesn't have to have a reason to start. It, that's the reason why it's called a random quantum fluctuation. It just does that's where the answer is like it just does yep. and that's the same answer for the religious right. like god is yeah. you know and that's 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 what i was like listening to and it, it's just some of the arguments were pretty interesting so i thought they were i would take your take on it yeah the thing is i would say that it's more reasonable to take the non-god hypothesis because it has the fewer assumptions you, you don't have to posit another dimension of reality to explain things you can say no it just it is what it is, just the same way you would say with God, but at least we're not ha having this new category of existence. But mm. all these arguments, like what I would say to this Muslim guy, what's his name? Asadullah. Ab Asadullah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say, um, uh, but this doesn't, even if there is a God who's behind this all, that doesn't mean Islam is true. Oh, yeah. No, that's the biggest problem I have with these. Uh, whenever I talk to the apologists, they never want to talk about Islam. They want to go with the yeah. okay, creator because they just want to be like sitting around in the, the conversation of creator. They never want to like, OK, fine. There's a sometime I even like, all right, fine. There's a creator. There's a God, whatever. Let's go to the point. How is Islam? But you know why? Because they, they, don't, they, don't, they, they never want to go there. Yeah. And the reason because they know that um, the liar, lunatic, or prophet argument doesn't work because the Christians use mm -hmm. the same thing, liar, lunatic, or Lord, and they don't find it convincing. They know that it's more reasonable to think that that Muhammad, uh, yeah, could have flat out lied or is just a front man, never said the things he said uh, to begin with. And it was, a you know, the Quran is the result of years and years and years of a bunch of people coming up with things. Like, they, they know that a guy like you and me can easily 
doubt this. Mm-hmm. So that's why they have to go yeah. into the, the, the philosophical arguments, which are very muddied, very, uh, I mean, we're talking about things that we can't possibly know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my language, there's a, th- a saying that says, your dog is dog and my dog is a to- is Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, their arguments are always like, nah, but our books are right. So it's always like, your dog is dog, my dog is Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I won't take any more of your time. Thanks a lot, Pre. Uh, yeah, uh, Doug, I should call. Yeah, him. and uh, all the best with uh, your family situation. Yeah, I, you know, I'm hanging in there, holding, holding on to, trying to keep it together. You know, but uh, hey, so it's one of those things you cannot choose to believe. It's like everybody's like, oh, just believe it. Why? What's your problem? Just be with your wife. Just believe Islam. And just you just can't choose what you believe. If you don't believe it, you just don't believe it. I, I mean. I'm even ready to be convinced. Show me some evidence. Show me something that is convincing. I'll change right yep. away. But have all no matter where. Have I'm... Allah light up a water-soaked napkin for me. <laughs> yeah, something like yeah. that. Anyway, thanks, yeah, God. Appreciate Take it. Care. Take care. Bye. Rooms open. Nice conversation. I think his channel name is the same as uh, his name, Desi Neo. How do we know the Big Bang happened? Through inference. But yeah, nobody was there. If his wife divorced him, would he remarry? That's a good question. I don't think uh, Muslims have that no remarry rule like Christians do. But Christians don't listen to it either. They remarry all the time. When it comes to coitus, coitus beats Jesus. People are not computers. Their minds are influenced by their hearts. Well, that is true, Proud Pharisee. Um, the heart does influence the brain because it pumps blood and therefore oxygen into the brain. And without the heart, the brain would die. So you're, you're right, but for the, probably the wrong reason. But uh, uh, Proud Pharisee, you are a moist robot. You're not special. None of us are special. This is what uh, religion really taps into, is that, that need to be loved, the need to be respected, the need to um, feel special. And a lot of people can't handle a world without God because then that specialness goes away. And I say, be stronger. Know that in the big context of things, the universe, that you're not special. You're smaller than a piece of dust in this universe. You're going to die, and within a couple generations, everyone's going to forget about you, and be okay with it. Once you can do that, you'll leave religion. But most people can't do it. Do you see deism as a half measure to atheism? It, like it's easier to convert to atheist to deism than full atheism? Yeah, it is easier because of the, the baggage that some atheists have brought into the conversation. But you can't really defend deism, really. It's just like, if I was a deist, I'd say, yeah, I'm a deist. And then someone asks, uh, if the atheist version of me asks myself, well, why are you a deist? That ah, just makes me feel comfortable. That'd be the best answer. Citation needed, proud Pharisee. If someone's heart stops, they can still think for a few seconds afterwards. Maybe even up to a minute. I think that fact alone contradicts the, some of the claims you're making. Room's open. Hey, proud Pharisee, you, you emailed me. You said you wanted to talk to me. Come on in. I was under the impression you wanted a mulligan.
a whole nation called the Jews did not hear from Yahweh. There, that will tempt you. What's a quantum fluctuation? Imagine um, electrons going around an atom of a, of a, of a nucleus of an atom. And then, and then kind of squint your eyes. And so it looks fuzzy in your brain. And then have then open your eyes real bright. That's a quantum fluctuation. <laughs> That's the chemistry way of explaining it. Yeah, deism is for um, for atheists who don't have the gonads to admit that they're atheist. Yeah, I offended some of my deist followers. I even I th I have a video of uh, William Lane Craig admitting that universes can be formed through quantum fluctuations, and that uni uh, one universe can create another universe. But he would he would just say that at some point anything has to be from God, like, and that whole infinite regress problem is not a problem because you're you're thinking about time lin like in a linear straight line thing. What if time doesn't work that way prior to the Big Bang? What if time is, um, yeah, it, what, if, what if there's a version of time that has nothing to do with entropy, for example? Like These are things we can't even imagine or hard for us to imagine. What do you say about Jewish survival? I think that's silliness. Hinduism is older than Judaism, and it survived. Well, is that true? Not Hinduism, sorry. Um, it's older than Christianity. Okay, now we've got people who want in. Bank style style? Banks I don't know if you if you're familiar with the street artists. No, I'm not familiar with street artists. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a very famous one called Banksy. Okay. And this inspired name. It's just Banksy style. Um how are you, sir? Uh, miss, is it um Mr. Creek or Pine? You can call <laughs> you can call me um what do you want? Call me Pine Creek for now, and then once if I like you, then you can call me Doug. <laughs> Certainly, um, yeah. The I've, I've tried actually calling in once before, but uh, um, I was uh, I was on the Theist Thursday session, and I'm not Theist enough uh, to uh, to participate in that one. So I figured this might be a well, good time for, for for a conversation. I am. I am. What I would put myself is in that category of what uh, Richard Dawkins said as a level, I think, six uh, atheist in the sense that I am agnostic about the existence of an, uh, an all creator of the universe, but I certainly don't live my life as if there is one. Um, that kind of a level. So, but I wouldn't put myself in that top atheist. Oh, we got to change of, that. I know. We got to change that. Yeah. <laughs> I know that there is no God. That's the part that I'm. Do I have your permission from, to you convert you into a hard atheist today? Uh, absolutely, I'm more than happy to uh, to indulge in any any okay. conversation that would perfect. Uh, so let's let's that. make you a hard atheist today. So um, the the key to being a hard atheist is to understanding what the word no means. So are we agreed mm -hmm. that you can say you know something and still be open to the idea that you're wrong? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're saying uh, when, as, and initially, I, I had to, I had to sort of get my head around when you said no, as in you mean knowledge, no, right. as in I do I know that there is no God, uh, do I have knowledge uh, of of something? Yes, yeah, I agree with what. Okay, so that. if you agree with me here, that you can say I, so I say I know there's no God of any sort. Okay, okay? but that does not mean that I can't be wrong. I could be wrong, but every God concept that I've encountered. I think the evidence is insufficient to say that that God is true. I think there's and many versions of, of these theisms that there's contradictory issues involved. And so therefore I can say, no, all of them are false. I know this is the case. Well, 
yeah, I can agree with you on the on the basis of the gods that most human beings are presenting, like Yahweh, uh, Allah, Jehovah, whoever. Those types of gods, I can say that yeah, I can I can. That's just, that's that's actually kind of my argument is I can. I don't know if there is a deistic creation creator of all things. If okay, you know, I, this I, is I the next step. Very good. Argue that. Very good. <clears throat> yeah. So we're agreed. You're one step away from becoming a hard atheist, and here it is. <laughs> By the way, uh, will you lose any family or friends if you become a hard atheist? Because I don't want to lead you down a path. I, I come from a Muslim background. I lost a lot of family and friends a long time ago. If that was the case, okay. <laughs> I think for the for, by, by with the first bottle of beer that I drank would have would have uh, <laughs> would have dropped off half the family, uh, and then the rest with the vodkas. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean my family are very liberal, so it's not. It doesn't really make any like, difference. They all know my ideas. In in order to say that you know uh, no gods exist, it's important in my opinion to have some way to uh, not only verify but falsify, mm. and. If you're bringing up, or if someone else is bringing up a concept of a deistic type God, my question would be, is there any way to falsify that idea? Yeah, okay. Like, do you think there uh, is? Actually, uh, well, I mean, the, the, it's just like the way uh, Dawkins puts it. There are the atheists, in, uh, permanent atheists in principle, or temporary atheists in principle, so you are arguing on the basis that you can be a temporary atheist in principle because eventually there will be a way to prove that there is no creator of the universe. No, no, or, no I'm not even saying that. I'm, I'm not even saying that. All I'm saying is that, or I'm asking the question, this nebulous, this fuzzy idea of God, this deistic God, like what are you imagining exactly? What is this God? Well, I mean... The thing is, the the way the the religious people tend to want to sway someone towards a deistic perspective is to say that okay, you don't believe Allah, you don't believe in jo Jesus or, or Jehovah or Yahweh or, or Vishnu or Krishna. Fine, we're going to leave that to one side. We're just going to try and get you to accept that there is. Do you accept that there is a potential that there is a force, and they will argue an intelligent force that was the initiator of everything that started right but what i'm saying is if you movement. if there's nothing concrete about this that you can falsify then we're talking mm. about almost anything and so it becomes almost a stupid irrelevant useless worthless mm. conversation so this is why i would say that i can say i know there are no gods or god uh and still someone can introduce to me this nebulous fuzzy deistic force but if there's no way to actually falsify it, it's, in my opinion, it's a relevant conversation. But we don't, do you know that there is no way to falsify it? That's the, that's well, the, the trick, though. Do, we, do, do you know that there is no way to falsify it? Uh, I don't have to know that. All I have to do, if someone's positing this God to me, I uh, can ask them the question, is there any way to falsify it? If they can't provide any way, then I'll say, then why are we talking about this? And we might as well believe in like in purple pixies, uh, pigs with wings. Like you can just imagine anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I usually use uh, uh, is it uh, uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, invisible teapot around the, right. the, the Mars or whatever. He says, you know, I don't know if there is an. Invisible so okay, teapot. here's here's the final step. We got to put the around. icing on the cake now. Okay. Mm. So you've agreed that you can make a knowledge claim and still be open to being wrong, which I do. So even this deistic nebulous type God could exist, but since there's no way to verify it nor falsify it, I can say, I know this God doesn't exist in the same way that I know this pen's going to fall because of, we can demonstrate it time and time again. We know now, could it be wrong? Could I be wrong that it, the pen goes up? Yes, but I know. And I think you would say, you know, that when I let go of the pen, it's going to fall down towards the ground. So in the same way, we can say that but, about all God concepts. But the thing is, even in that case, even in the in the case of your pencil example, you can say, I, I like to think it's within percentage certainty. So you can say within 99% certainty that that pen will always fall right. to the ground, whilst there may be that 1% or even a point. Yeah, we already discussed this. Time. 
mm. right? When, when, when we said we could make a knowledge claim and still be wrong, that's that percentage. That's that percent. So, so you are you you you're really just saying this is on a scale of percentage that I can say with you have to be omniscient. You have to be omniscient yeah. to, I'd say, truly say you know. Yeah, it, it, with the Cartesian now, certainty, it's, it's, right? So, and most people don't talk that way. Most people don't think that way. Most people, when they say they know things, they they mean but, it in terms of probability. Theists, uh, sorry, theists, especially those who want to argue. I mean, I was literally. Wait, wait a minute. Are you a hard atheist thinking. today? Now. Um, I mean, again, yes, but the thing is, again, yes, I, but... I still say I was, I was where you were, way where, where you were at the beginning, anyway, with that 90, 90, 90 Oh, you were a hard atheist and didn't know I it. Say, but no, no. But what I'm saying is that maybe I, yeah, I mean, I was, but the thing is that I still left myself enough uh, honest gap to say that since exactly what you said, I'm not omniscient. I cannot honestly know it all, and so I cannot fully say that I am, you know, one hundred. But when you say fully, you mean this hundred percent business. As a hundred percent, exactly. We'll, we'll get it. Nobody, exactly. nobody except for precepts think that way. But the thing is, that's where the theists squeeze in their god, the god of the gaps, is when you give them that ninety nine point nine percent. They go, yeah, but that one yeah. percent or what zero point one percent hey i got that's where my god i is. got two disciples wanting to listen uh talk to me <laughs> their names are mark and luke they're in the wings here so i'll let you go but i i really oh. love the fact that you became a hard atheist today uh you'll get <laughs> you'll you. get from the head office uh a gift card from out for applebee's for twenty dollars that 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 is that's that, that's what i live for okay <laughs> so what more do i need thank you have a great day See ya. <laughs> thank you mama <laughs> uh mark and luke are the same man oh okay he's uh listening to me T turn it off mark and luke there you go you're on now uh, thank you very much. Uh, how should I call you, Mr. Pine Creek? Yeah, Mr. Pine Creek sounds really good to me. Uh, Mr. Pine Creek, the, the great hot at atheist. <laughs> so your name is Mark and Luke are the same man. No, no, it, it's just a joke. I want to uh, ask you something. Uh, I, I, I watch your uh, debate with uh, the Catholic man. Uh, I forget his name. Oh, uh, Trent Horn. Uh, yeah, sure. So I was wondering that uh, I, I, I am insane or he's insane or people are insane. Uh, we are supposed to believe uh, that the best explanation is resurrection uh, until we prove wrong. Is, is there, there the, uh, what's the, the burden, burden of proof? I don't know if that's the, the work is, is on them or is on us. We have to disprove <laughs> resurrection to a star so they don't believe or is on us. Um I would say uh, they're making the claim, so it's on them. But I'm t I'm totally okay on basically explaining why I don't believe it and why I see problems with the whole like all the plot holes and everything. So if if someone wants me to to take uh, the burden, I'll take it. I'm not. A, I'm yeah, not. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, yes, just uh, I was wondering because. Uh, I have here uh, these this sentences, and I don't know if this is insane for you, but is that I will continue to believe in Allah, Yahweh, Brahma, Jesus, everything, until uh, they show me that this is false. Uh, versus what I think is, is original to say is I will start believing in Allah, Yahweh, Jesus, uh, Braha, even reptilians, the extraterrestrial, and something like that, when they show me that it's true. It's not, not that uh, logical sense. Or is I'm, I'm insane. No, I, I think um, with, for example, with Christianity, you could just say something like, okay, I, I need to see um, someone dead for three days and coming back to life that's been verified. Uh, when I say verified, I mean we have doctors who say, hey, he's definitely dead, and doctors who say he's definitely alive, uh, many witnesses of many different biases that are just not claims written on paper. And so that alone, you can say, you're, you're taking the burden. I know dead people don't come back to life. 
uh, and here's my evidence. The evidence is we've never seen any verified uh, examples of that. And in order for me to believe that someone was dead for three days and came back to life, I would need more than just someone saying, um, writing on, in, on a piece of paper that they saw it 2,000 years ago. Now, that sucks. Like, even if it's true, that sucks because I'm basically saying that evidence is not good enough. And if that's all we have, then I'm not a Christian and just live with it. I understand. Uh, okay. Uh, I can live with that. I'm fine with that. Thank you very much. Bye yep. Time. See ya. But yeah, the whole idea of believing something until proven false, you're going to be um, believing a lot of things in life. Myron, my, my assistant here, he actually died last night and rose from the dead this morning. You got to believe it until proven false, right? Room's open. What time is it? I'll go for um, a little while longer. Can you prove it's impossible? <laughs> no. Well, someone had a good question about induction. How would you test induction or whatever? By uh, demonstrating that it doesn't work. That's how. Got to go. This was fun. I'll be back, says Proud Pharisee. Proud Pharisee, I'm giving you opportunities to come on, and then you leave. Like, who doesn't love a Pharisaic Jew? They're my favorite. No, you don't want to work for Myron Tux. His hygiene's terrible. He farts a lot. I believe that last caller owes you a thousand dollars. Really? Which, which caller? The one, the hard atheist caller, or the one who just came in? They pretend they want evidence, but the fact is they know, noth they know nothing you're going to provide will be sufficient. It's about not wanting it to be true. Uh, myself. You know, there's a way to test that, right? What you're saying could be true in many cases. But it can, al and it can, can also be true in my case. But there's a way to, to clear this up and know for sure. So when I say that my whole paradigm, my whole worldview would shift if someone came on and prayed in the name of Jesus or Allah or whoever to light up a, my water-soaked nap napkin. The way we test that is to do it. The reason why you say what you say is because you don't have the confidence that your God's going to do anything. I'm assuming you're a Christian and you're not just being sarcastic. Christians know it's not going to happen. They don't have any faith in their God to do stuff like that. It, it boggles my mind how powerless Christians and Muslims view their God. They'll talk about cancer remission to the cows come home. But they will not, for one second, entertain the idea that their God will actually do something amazing. Doug is scared to try with a dry napkin. Well, a dry napkin would be a start, too. The reason why I say wet napkin is because of 1 Kings 18. I 
like all these Christians talking about God answered prayer here, God answered prayer there, and yet they don't have the gumption, they don't have the backbone to actually do an amazing miracle. Like walking into a gravesite and praying to, that someone will rise from the dead that's been dead for years. They, they just don't have enough faith. First time I have made a live chat. Thank you for buffing up my atheist armor. You're welcome, Zelda mother of all. Thanks for coming out of the shadows. Exposing yourself. You can't hear me? Yeah, you can. Can God teach chemistry to any of his worshipers? Oh, if it exists, yeah, sure. So this whole talk about, oh, you would never change your mind even if you did see it. Prove us wrong. Actually do something amazing. Well, we have the scriptures. Yeah. Why do you believe the Bible has anything to do with a God? Why do you believe the Quran has anything to do with a God? Why do you believe the Vedas have anything to do with a God? Why do you think the Book of Mormon has anything to do with a God? And every answer you give is going to come up short. Because you just do, right? Because that's what mommy and daddy told me. Because that's what this apologist said. These prophecies, I mean, they have to be true. There's no way we can make them better and more specific. We need a face reveal from Myron. No, Myron is hideous. Hey, I remember you. Hi, Doc. Oh, you're the guy who I did the... Look what I got. I still got it here. Nice. <laughs> so for... Can I ask a... Uh, uh... Can we talk about evidence for a little? I can ask you a little, like, uh, about your preference for evidence. Sure, but I just want to let people know who you are. You're the guy who, who came on, uh, but what several months ago now, who said you could, from all I get, uh, you actually did a real test to see if you could pick um, the Quran from the Bible from another book underneath a blanket, right? Sure. Yeah. And then you failed that. And then I, last time we talked, you said you were highly doubting Islam. Mm -hmm. So are you still a Muslim? <laughs> um, I didn't think it was a tough question. I, I, I would say yes, but... I'm doubting. I'm doubting, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, what's your question about evidence? So you were we were, you were talking like uh, a little like oh if God came and like uh, ignited my napkin I would believe. No, I never said that. I said it would change my whole paradigm, my world view. Then it would take me to the next step of investigating which religion is correct, what version of the religion is correct. That sort of thing. So if you take away your uh, atheism and look at all religion claims, which, what religion would you say is closest to you on a personal level? Oh, that's a tough question. Closest to me, meaning how? I mean, I, I, I do believe that uh, we don't pick our own religions uh, and we don't really uh, pick what we believe and things like that. And I wonder if I am doubting my uh, belief in Islam because of personal preference, uh, evidence, or if it is just because I don't want to believe anymore. And I'm I'm kind of 
I want to know what what how how I can look at the evidence of 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 the Islamic uh, point of view from an outside. Oh, point of okay. View. Well, I can help you that there. Uh, the way I look at the evidence okay. for Islam, not deism, not like we're not talking about contingency or cause uh, the cosmological argument, but just Islam, which is Muhammad and the Quran and the Hadiths and all that, is that you just have uh, men. Uh, how many? Fourteen hundred years ago creating texts based on mm. prior texts, based on maybe some um, new ideas that have nothing to do with a God, that the miracle claims never happened, that there's naturalistic explanations for Muhammad's life, even if he was trustworthy in some of his business dealings, that doesn't mean he's trustworthy in other areas. Um, and so, in other words, a god could have nothing to do with the Quran, and we could still have it exactly the way we have it today. Do you think personal experience uh, should just be showed away? Like, just you, I, I should take away my personal experience because no, that's that's kind of kind of what what I I I uh, you know you. I'm stuck. Yeah, on. everybody has personal experiences, and that's fine. The question is, do you have defeaters? Do you have reasons to think that that you should question your personal experiences? And when it comes to like, um, let's say I was to see someone who I know to be dead walking right across my office right now, mm. since that's not in our in my prior experience in my life, now that could be real, or I could have a tumor pressing against a certain part of my brain. So before I start thinking that, oh, there was an actual dead person walking across my uh, office, and if I'm alone and nobody mm. else to verify it, uh, I ought to, uh, that's a defeater to that belief, and I ought to not believe that it actually happened. Mm. Now, if my dog walks across, I don't have any defeaters for that. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. So now, do we have defeaters for religion like like Islam? Yes, we got people making up stories. We have people borrowing from other texts. We have people making grandiose mm. claims all the time, mm. which doesn't mean it's true. Some of it could be true, but I, I think I think one of my problems is that personal experience can't be uh, re elevated. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, reliable, you mean? Like we, we... Sorry? You, personal experience can't be reliable? Is that what you meant? Uh, yeah, and re-elevated. We, we can't... Oh, uh, eva we evaluated? Can't... Yes, re-elevated. Sorry. Uh, it's my noichiness coming to, through. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we can't go back in time and, and kind of like change, change it. And I just feel like... I I feel I feel like if I'm if I'm letting go of my personal experience, it will not mean that much to me anymore, and that's kind of why I'm clinging to it. Do you understand? Well, I'm not. I don't think anybody's asking you to let go of your personal experiences. Like the things that you experience, you experience. The question is, how do you explain it? How what attribution do you put to it? What does it mean? Um, can we check it with other things to make sure it is what it is? Um, mm. so yeah, you don't have to give up your personal experiences, but see, for example, there was many times in my Christian life where I thought God was near to me and God was speaking to me. Now I look back on it and I can say, no, that was the community I was in. That was, was my own thoughts. That was the situation I was in where I was feeling sad. And so my brain reinterprets things and even makes up things to help cope with the pain. And mm. so it's just... You look at it differently. So if you became an atheist today, um, it, it you can still validate those personal experiences, but you just describe them differently now. Mm. So what do you say? You want to give your life to atheism today? <laughs> uh, no. No. But uh, <laughs> keep hanging on. Uh, you cling. You don't let go. 
No, but uh, yeah, but uh, I, I, I don't want. I, I feel I, 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 I could, I could to a certain point move away from Islam into theism, and then I, I, I feel like I'm more theist than I am Islamic. But I, I, I can't, I can't get away from the theist point of view because well, that's fine. I don't, I'm just. Yeah. If you want to be a deist, that's fine. It's like I said that earlier on this live stream. Like a theist, a theist, yes. a general theist. Yes, a general theist. Yeah. Okay, but what does that mean to you? What's a general theist? Uh, a general theist is someone that believes in God, uh, but uh, is not sure what what kind of God. Well, that's more. That I, I would call that a deist. Okay, uh, maybe I don't. Yeah, with know a D, the D not a T H. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it, it's unfalsifiable, and it's probably the only thing it does for you is maybe gives you some comfort, and it might explain. You could say, "Well, I think God created everything," and and but I think also it's it, yeah. I also came to the conclusion like during the Ramadan, uh, Ramadan just ended yesterday. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Well, that means all the uh, NBA basketball so... players can be at full strength. <laughs> yeah, so it's eight, uh, eight now, and it's just during Ramadan I fasted, and I used a lot of time because uh, we're supposed to read the whole Quran during uh, the month of of Ramadan. How much weight did you lose? So I did that. Uh, probably like ten, fifteen kilos. Oh wow, maybe. thirty pounds. Oh yeah, yeah. Over what time frame? Is it a month? Yeah, yeah. See, basically, I'm doing Ramadan right now, too. <laughs> Seriously, I eat one meal a day, but I eat it in the morning instead of after sunset. And uh, yeah, when you ate, did you like really pig out, or or do you have to like eat in moderation? Uh, no, I I have to eat in moderation because if I pig out, I will it's, just be yeah, sick. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, because uh, especially with Norwegian uh, time and when 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 I have to sleep and work and wake up and things like that, so I fast from let's say four o'clock at night to uh, eight o'clock. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, four o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night. So it's many hours of, of not sleeping uh eating sorry when you're supposed to be active as so well. do you eat at 3 30 in the morning uh yeah i i woke up like uh eating before uh before and then went back to sleep and slept and then woke up and worked normally yeah uh ramadan during during uh ramadan i i do see that my my mood get different and my concentration get different yeah you're more alert right everything's like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. oh that yeah one. see even though i i think islam is false i do see the benefits of ramadan like you can you mm -hmm. can leave islam uh, become an apostate and still participate in Ramadan. I don't see any problem with that. Yeah, I guess maybe maybe because I I I I found it such a sincere religious experience as well. I like I I I find. Well, let's very... not go too far. <laughs> <laughs> Because like I inter basically Ramadan is intermittent <laughs> fasting, and I do that too. But I I'm not having any spiritual experiences. Yeah, but I, we, uh, okay. But here he, here's my point of view. I I don't know if I see enough evidence to believe, but I. I just can't get over the two biggest turtles. The problem of evil uh, that shows me actually that I I believe in God uh, because. Oh, you're saying the problem uh, with evil is actually not a problem, but it's evidence to, for God. Yes. Oh, that's a problem. Yes. 
Would you um, agree it's a problem? As, as, as many. Uh, no. Because uh, there's as many Muslims uh, 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 who believe that life is a test. And uh, if there's no nothing to be tested on. Well, the problem you have is if everybody, the problem you have is everybody would pass the test. The problem I see with Sorry. Islam that Christians also have is um, mm. with the problem of evil, you have a creator being that can see the future with either certainty or a high degree of probability and desire to create something it hates. With Islam, it's more disbelief, whereas with Christianity, it's they would just call it sin. And, mm. and so now this is a problem of the contradiction of want and not want. Allah mm. wants to create, yet doesn't want the result of his creation, which is disbelief. Now, I understand that in Islam, Allah wants to have sin so he can forgive people. But mm -hmm. then, really what you're left with, with is this evil concept of God who didn't need to create, but chose to anyhow, just so he can have his kicks and say, oh, look at them doing all these bad stuff. Ah, oh, but at least they can ask for forgiveness and I'll feel great. I mean, it's horrible. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's horrible, but maybe it's what we need. I, I, I it's not about I, what we I need. It's about what if mm. Allah needs something. Like if Allah ne needed to create, then he's not omnipotent. So most theists, most Muslims say, no, he didn't need to create. But yet they would admit that Allah's not okay with just the tiniest little bit of, of disbelief. And yet he creates knowing this will result in what he hates. So either Allah is a sadomasochist who just loves to uh, create things he hates, or he doesn't exist. Oh, that's probably a false dichotomy, but I'll I'll, I'll stick with it. <laughs> Anyhow, become a deist. Live your life. Don't worry. There's no hell. Um, and that's it. It's easy. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah. You think Ramadan like feels said, good? Uh, yeah. I tell you, atheism is like breath of fresh air. You can breathe. Well, I was an atheist for many, many years before I became a Muslim. So. Oh, you went into Islam kicking and screaming. Um, uh, I wouldn't say kicking and screaming, but I would say I, I went into it thinking definitely that I was going to disprove Islamia. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, I hear this all the time. That's what yeah. I, I hear from Christians mostly, but um, it, it is an old story of, I used to be an atheist. I was going to prove Christianity wrong, prove Islam wrong, but I found out I couldn't, mm. and therefore I, you know, I find myself in it. Yeah, I hear that all the time. But usually it's... You don't believe it? No, no, no. <laughs> there are no true atheists? <laughs> it, what tends to happen is there's usually psychological and emotional reasons to going into the, the belief and and also just poor epistemology where if you're going into it to prove it wrong, I think you have the wrong attitude. You You should be going in it um, doubting that any of it's true or the core mm. propositions, propositions are true and then asking the question, do I have good reason to think it's true rather than uh, can I prove it false? Mm. And w yeah. when you frame it that way and look at it that way, I tell you, every Christian, every Muslim listening right now, they're going to go, oh my, I mean, is this really sufficient reasons to think that Allah sent Gabriel down to Muhammad. I mean, no, this is not sufficient. So, Doug, if you had to pick a religion. Oh, yeah, that was your first question to me. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I think I'd have to pick Christianity just because my family is, and it would make it easier. It'd be a very pragmatic reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good reason. Yeah. Isn't it? 
Yeah. Pragmatic reasons are very yeah. good reasons sometimes. But um, I felt I felt sorry. I, I I listened to that other Muslim man that called in, and I felt very sad for yeah, him. Yeah, with his wife and stuff. Yeah. With his wife. Yeah, I'm not married. But you see what religion does to people, like his wife. Mm. But she won't even listen mm. to guys like me, even though I'm like the nicest guy on YouTube. Uh, she would just turn me off as soon as, like, she could not listen to us having this conversation right now. It's yeah. sad, and that the I think that's extremely sad. Yeah, and there's that certain form of religion, and it's you know not all Muslims are like that, not all Christians are like that, but it, it's just like plug your ears, close your eyes, anything negative, don't even hear it. Do you think God has a scale if he exists? A scale? Yeah, of 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 how Muslim or how Christian you are. <laughs> if he exists, nah, he probably knows. He's omniscient, right? So anyhow, I got other callers. Thanks. Okay, sorry, Doc. Yeah, thanks for calling. Thanks for staying in touch. Thank you for taking my yeah. call. Bye. Sam left. Hey game, how are you today? Pretty good. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? You have something to say? I'm just hanging out. How about you? I'm just staying on my bed. Oh, you're just staying on your bed. You've called him before, haven't yes. you? Yeah. yeah. You're lonely, aren't you? Yes, I'm lonely. You're lonely. You have a girlfriend? Yeah. You do have a girlfriend. Well, then you're not that lonely. Yes, I know. It's just a baby. You got a bit. Your, uh, your mic is too close to your mouth. She's away from me. She's waiting for you. No, she's, she's far. Oh, she's far away from you. Are you sad about that? Yes. Yeah. Oh. I want you. Are you married? Am I married? Yes. Oh, how many siblings? I mean, how many? Yeah. How many sons and daughter? I have one of each. How about you? Where's your wife? Where's your wife? Where's my wife? Yes. She's at work. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you have any siblings? Yeah, we are four. You have four siblings? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 32. 32. You sound younger than that. Oh, thank you. Are you, uh, but you're not married? No, not yet. How come, what's holding you back from getting married and having kids? Oh. Mm. Work. Work. Family. Do you live on a farm? No, no, no. Why do you have a rooster? Oh, it's a province. It's what? Province. Province? I don't, I don't, under, I don't yeah. understand you. But anyhow, I hope you have a good life. Yeah. Take care. Where are you, where are you here in Irvine? Hey, Sam. Hey, Doug, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you doing? Good, good, thanks. And you? Me? Oh, I'm doing well. Good. Do you have a question? Do you have a question for me? Sam. Question. I'm, I'm not. I was raised a Hindu. I'm. Hey, can you you can hear me? Yeah. Okay? Make sure your other tab is off, okay? Because um, my guess is you're hearing oh. me on delay. Hold on. Let me close my tab. Yeah. Yeah. 
I have closed all the tabs. Yeah, my I have a question. So I was raised a Hindu, so I, I don't know much about Christianity. I've learned on, you know, just watching YouTube videos. But one question I've always had, maybe you can help me with it. Okay. Did Jesus know he was God when he came down in flesh on earth? Uh, most Christians would say yes to that. But then did he really suffer? Like if I know I'm God, if somebody's doing stuff to me, I know I'm going to be fine. Right, but he still uh, felt physical pain. Yeah, but it's like if he can, if he's God, you know, how much is really the pain? Well, they would, most Christians would say that um, Jesus, that person of God, chose to suffer uh, and not um, kind of dull the pain. Like it, there's oh. no holy Tylenol. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, I just have I've had that question since I started listening to many YouTube channels. That's all I had. I just I wanted to yeah. ask you that. But you question. know what's interesting is that uh, in order for Christianity to be true, at least most versions, that really the only thing that died that day when Jesus was crucified was uh, his flesh. Yeah. His soul lived on. And so the whole atonement theory is based on the death and resurrection of amino acids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if he's God, like he didn't really die, right? And he knew he wasn't really dying. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a nice a just... nice weekend sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Are you still are you still a Hindu? I mean, I'm not a practicing Hindu, like I, I'm just I'm a casual Hindu, I would say. What uh how about your parents? I mean, they're casual too. Like we were not a religious family. So Okay. So you don't have like statues of Ganesh or Vishnu? We do actually do. My wife is religious, so we do have statues at home. But I like she prays every day. I don't really. I pray like a couple times a year when we have some big festivals and we have people over. So it's more like communal thing. Okay. Than a religious thing. Yeah. Interesting. What what yeah. are you in India? Yeah, I am not in India. I'm in US, but I am Indian. I'm from India. Okay. But I, I live in US now for many years. Are your parents in India? They live in India still, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to know about Hinduism, I can try to <laughs> I don't know. I'm not an expert. Do you think uh Christi <laughs> do you think Christianity borrowed from Hinduism at all? I'm sure they did. It did, right? Because it, Hinduism is older. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't have like, I'm not a scholar, so I can't prove anything. But it makes sense. Like the parting of the sea, there are like tales like that in Hinduism too. Like Krishna, apparently when he was born, he was transported from one spot to the other in a river. And then his, so the river was raging and his pinky or his toe touched the river and the whole thing parted and then they went through. So, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, you, you <laughs> Jews, you stole from the Hindus. You can look it up. You, I hope I'm When, right. when do you think this was written? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's in like the Mahabharata, like around the Bhagavad Gita time, around that time. So I don't know exactly how many years. Yeah. Thousands of years ago was that. I mean, definitely more than 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Well, it would have to be more than 3,000 years ago. Otherwise, the Christians will say, yeah. no, I'm, yeah, the mm -hmm. Jews came up with yeah. it first. Yeah. And I'm sure it could be like maybe the Hindus borrowed it from the Jews. Who knows? Well, let me ask you this, because you probably have some friends or relatives that are serious Hindus, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they really believe Ganesh exists? Uh not necessarily because in Hinduism there are like many gods. So it's like you just believe in God and it has many forms. So Ganesh is just Okay, but they do believe so most people, that Yeah, they would believe some god exists. All right, okay. Yeah. And like and do they believe um most of them believe in reincarnation, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very big big uh, deal in Hinduism. So the idea is you behave like you follow all the rules you behave well and then you don't get reincarnated 
that's kind of the end goal. Are most Hindus evangelical in nature? In other words, if a, a devout Hindu were here in this room with us, would he or she want me to become a Hindu? No, 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 most, no, we don't, there's no evangelizing in Hindus. Why is that? Like, wouldn't they want me not to be reborn as a worm? No, but I don't like they like I think most Hindus like I'm sure there are exceptions don't think that you're doing anything wrong by not being Hindu. They're fine with it. Like you will still be like if you do well, like you don't have to believe in Ganesh. Like if you're a good person and however the God judges you, you will be fine. Like you don't have to believe in Ganesh or worship him or to for that to happen. What's the name of that really good looking female God? This Kali, I don't know if you want to call good looking or not, but she's the one who has like a sword and eight arms. She kills, yeah, eight arms, and she she kills like some bad guy, and she has her head in one of her hands. Yeah, see, that's that's a goddess I can get behind. Yeah. <laughs> I know the stories are fantastic. Like in Hinduism, you can't beat the stories. Like the <laughs> the mythology is pretty good. Yeah, I remember a long time ago I made a video on Hinduism, like kind of making it look bad and and I had a lot of Hindus for that like one video come on my channel and make comments yeah. and stuff so th they do get defensive like Christians and Muslims do yeah they will I mean yeah most will that's why I'm not showing my face or anything I'm not showing my okay face. <laughs> they will no they will get defensive I mean there are there are like Hindus and Muslims you know they don't get along sometimes really. yeah so there is a lot of that why are the Hindus in the in the, in the United States, so smart. I, it's not. No, I don't think they're smart. It's just you're I not mean, smart. Most people. No, I, I don't know. I, Come on, I don't be don't me. be humble. You're a smart guy, right? I I, I yeah. I'm what okay. was your GRE you know what, score? <laughs> honestly, you know what? I don't know. I took it twice actually because I did a graduate degree, second graduate degree. Oh, so you're like me. Twice. What what your yeah. your two graduate degrees? So I'm actually. The reason I like, I mean, I'm in, I'm in pharmaceutical sciences, so I, I understand. Like, anal I know you are an analytical chemist, right? right? Well, I was. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I did that for a long time, yeah. Oh, so you got, you got a degree in finance and then in? No, 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 ph pharmacy, pharmaceutical. Okay, but you said you had two graduate degrees, right, or no? Yeah, so I had like, so at first I did a master's, then I went back for Oh, I see what you're saying. So I had to retake a GRE, yeah. Oh, you had to take it again just to get your PhD? Yeah, be no, no, because there was a gap. Like, I think this, it's valid for oh, only five years. Oh, I see. So it was just a checkbox. They were they were going to take me anyway. Yeah, because yeah, I, I got, um, I have one Hindu friend who plays poker with me, and he's really smart too. Yeah, no, I think it's, I don't know if everybody's smart, but the thing is like most people who come here from India, you know, at least have like a bachelor's degree or even math and they come here to study further. So, you know, you're, it's selective. Yeah, yeah. It's not. Natural selection. Yeah. yeah <laughs> some selection going on there. <laughs> yeah. But there are quite a few dumb Indian people. I can oh, yeah, I'm sure there is. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's your favorite Indian food? I mean, I, I like the standard stuff, like butter chicken, tandoori chicken. That's that's all good. Butter chicken? Tandoori chicken. Yeah, you have never had butter chicken? Was it just a chicken smothered in butter? No, no, it's it's the way it's made. It's a, it's a great, you know, you should try it next time. How do you prepare it? Oh, that's, I'm sure you I'll, can. I'll, I'll just it's, Google it's, it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like the most famous Indian dish. I've had roti. Is that Indian? Yeah, roti is Indian, but that's the bread. That's the bread that you eat with the chicken. Okay. I thought the roti was even like the meat inside of it, the bread sometimes. No, no. So that's like, there are different kinds of roti. So you can, there are certain types of breads which are like stuffed. Yeah, those you can eat as is. But most commonly when people say roti, that's just a bread that you eat with something, with some curry. Hmm. Yeah, the problem with um, yeah. with a lot of East Indian food is um, your breath stinks horrible after. Yeah, you have to, you know, take a, <clears throat> do some mouthwash or take a main. <laughs> Same with something. Mexican food. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, I tell you, like, you can, it tastes great, but you can't kiss anyone after. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you can you can brush your teeth or you know something. Yeah, it tastes good. So. But I mean, like, but you you're, you're yeah. burping up fumes for like days. <laughs> yeah, not, not one not once you get used to it. <laughs> once your stomach gets used to it, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, thanks for calling in, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've been a long time listener. I've been I've never seen caught you live, so this is the first time I caught you oh, live, wow. and I have to get in. Yeah, I, I all I, I everything I've learned about Christianity is from you. Yeah, so I don't know if that's good. You're not bored of it? No, it's fun. I like when people call in and because I'm starting to get bored of it. Them. It is. It does get sometimes. It is gets repetitive. Yeah, right? because you can only do so much, right? I like the precepts. They're funny. I, I enjoy them. Yeah, yeah. I I like the precepts too. It's yeah, yeah. Eating a precept for because lunch. the every. Yeah, because the evidential part, like they have no evidence, right? So it's easy to defeat the precept. You have to do some mental gymnastics to defeat the precepts. Yeah, well, they're not all wrong, like in in why, like I understand their position. I understand like even before, even yeah, before you I have understand. to talk about the evidence, you have to have, you know, what does evidence mean? What's the basis for it and yeah. all that? I, I get them, but, but yeah. it's still like nobody becomes a Christian because of, no. You know, and the, the the problem they bring up is valid, but the solution is not. Like you can have any solution to that problem. You can have Ganesh as the solution or Allah or anything, right? Yeah, exactly. Like the final authority could be anything. And then they bring in Christianity. But but it's fun. Like otherwise it will be boring. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, all the best to you. All right. Thank you. Take, Bye. Take hey, Tux, I see you there, but I uh, I need to end the live stream start the music and go potty. How long have we gone, Myron? Two hours, 46 minutes and 38 seconds. Yeah, my wife eats, or used to eat, a lot of East Indian food. There's a relationship between the, a lot of Caribbean people in India. Don't get bored of this. Well, I don't want to become an old, bitter man like Matt Delahunty. Sorry, Matt, if you're listening. But if Matt were here, you would agree. Like, it gets repetitive. Oh yeah, chakras, third eye. I should ask about that stuff. I mean, there's some crazy, crazy stuff. The thing is, a lot of people who are Christians in the United States, they give up that bad belief erroneous belief and then they go into crazier beliefs well not crazier just as crazy like with chakras and crystals it's like stop being so needy stop being so human if we all could just be moist robots we'd be a much better society How many people have I converted? Myron, you got the stats? I got a, qu I got a quota. In 2021, what was it? I deconverted 1,834. Is that right, Satan? Yeah, Satan does confirm. Poof. 